On Old Age by Cicero And should my service, Titus, ease the weight of care that wrings your heart, and draw the sting which rankles there, what guerdon shall there be? For I may address you, Atticus, in the lines in which Flamininus was addressed by the man who, poor in wealth, was rich in honor's gold. Though I am well assured that you are not, as Flamininus was, kept on the rack of care by night and day. For I know how well, ordered and equable your mind is, and am fully aware that it was not a surname alone which we brought home with you from Athens, but its culture and good sense. And yet, I have an idea that you are at times stirred to the heart by the same circumstances as myself. To console you for these is a more serious matter, and must be put off to another time. For the present, I have resolved to dedicate to you an essay on old age. For from the burden of impending, or at least advancing age, common to us both, I would do something to relieve us both. Though as to yourself, I am fully aware that you support and will support it as you do everything else, with calmness and philosophy. But directly, I resolved to write on old age. You at once occurred to me as a deserving a gift of which both of us might take advantage. To myself, indeed, the composition of this book has been so delightful that it has not only wiped away all the disagreeables of old age, but has even made it luxurious and delightful too. Never, therefore, can philosophy be praised as highly as it deserves, considering that its faithful disciple is able to spend every period of his life with unruffled feelings. However, on other subjects I have spoken at large, and shall often speak again. This book, which I herewith send to you, is on old age. I have put the whole discourse not, as Alisto of Kost did, in the mouth of Tythonus, for a mere fable would have lacked conviction, but in that of Marcus Cato, when he was an old man, to give my essay greater weight. I represent Laelius and Scipio at his house, expressing surprise at his carrying his ears so lightly, and Cato answering them. If he so seemed to show somewhat more learning in this discourse than he generally did in his own books, put it down to Greek literature of which it is known that he became an eager student in his old age. But what need of more? Cato's own words will at once explain all I feel about old age. M. Cato, Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus the Younger, Gaius Laelius. Scipio. Many a time have I in conversation with my friend Gaius Laelius here expressed my admiration, Marcus Cato, of the eminent, nay perfect wisdom displayed by you indeed at all points, but above everything because I have noticed that old age never seemed a burden to you, when to most old men it is so hateful that they declare themselves under a weight heavier than Etna. Cato. Your admiration is easily excited, it seems, my dear Scipio and Laelius. Men, of course, who have no resources in themselves for securing a good and happy life, find every age burdensome. But those who look for all happiness from within can never think anything bad which nature makes inevitable. In that category, before anything else comes old age, to which all wish to attain, and at which all grumble when attained, such as follies and consistency and unreasonableness. They say that it is stealing upon them faster than they expected, in the first place, who compelled them to hug an illusion? For in what respect did old age steal upon manhood faster than manhood upon childhood? In the next place, in what way would old age have been less disagreeable to them if they were in their 800th year than their 80th? For the past, however long, when once it was past, would have no consolation for a stupid old age. Wherefore, if it is your want to admire my wisdom and I would that it were worthy of your good opinion and of my own name of Sapiens. It really consists in the fact that I follow nature, the best of guides, as I would a god, and am loyal to her commands. It is not likely, if she has written the rest of the play well, that she has been careless about the last act like some idle poet. But after all, some, quote, last, was inevitable, just as to the berries of a tree and the fruits of the earth there comes in the fullness of time a period of decay and fall. A wise man will not make agreements of this. To rebel against nature, is that not to fight like the giants with the gods? Laelius. And yet, Cato, you will do us a very great favor. I venture to speak for Scipio as for myself. If, since we all hope, or at least wish, to become old men, you would allow us to learn from you in good time before it arrives, 
by what methods we most easily acquire the strength to support the burden of advancing age. Cato. I will do so without doubt, Laelius, especially if, as you say, it will be agreeable to Scipio as well. Laelius. We do wish very much, Cato, if it's no trouble to you, to be allowed to see the nature of the bourne which you have reached after completing a long journey, as it were, upon which we too are to embark. Cato. I will do the best that I can, Laelius. It has often been my fortune to hear the complaints of my contemporaries. Like will to like. You know, according to the old proverb, complaints to which men like Salinator and Albinus, who were of consular rank in about my time, used to give vent. They were, first, that they had lost the pleasures of the senses, without which they did not regard life as full at all. And secondly, that they were neglected by those from whom they had been used to receive attentions. Such men appear to me to lay the blame on the wrong thing. For a pater familius of the management of his property if he is squandering it, Thereupon, the old poet is said to have read to the judges the play he had on hand and had just composed, the Oedipus Colonius, and to have asked them whether they thought that the work of a man of weak intellect. After reading, he was acquitted by the jury. Did old age then compel this man to become silent in his particular act, or Homer, Hesiod, Simonides, or Isocrates and Gorgias, whom I mentioned before, or the founders of schools of philosophy? Pythagoras, Democritus, Plato, Xenocrates, or Leto Zeno and Cleanthes, or Diogenes the Stoic, whom you too saw at Rome. Is it not rather the case with all these that the active pursuit of study only ended with life? But to pass over these sublime studies, I can name some rustic Romans from the Sabine district, neighbors and friends of my own, without whose presence farm work of importance is scarcely ever performed, whether sowing or harvesting or storing crops, and yet, in other things, this is less surprising, for no one is so old to think that he may not live a year. But they bestowed their labor on what they know does not affect them in any case. He plants his trees to serve a race to come, as our old poet statues say in his comrades. Nor indeed would the farmer, however old, hesitate to answer anyone who asked him for what he was planting. For the immortal gods, whose will it was that I should not merely receive these things from my ancestors, but should also hand them on to the next generation. That remark about the old man is better than the following. If age bought nothing worse than this, it were enough to mar our bliss, that he who bides for many years sees much to shun and much for tears. Yes, and perhaps much that gives him pleasure, too. Besides, as the subject for tears, he often comes upon them in youth as well. A still more questionable sentiment in the same Cecilius is, No greater misery can of age be told than this, be sure the young dislike the old. Delight in them is nearer the mark than dislike. For just as old men, if they are wise, take pleasure in the society of young men of good parts, and as old age is rendered less dreary for those who are courted and liked by the youth, so also do young men find pleasures in the maxims of the old, by which they are drawn to the pursuit of excellence. Nor do I perceive that you find my society less pleasant than I do yours. But this is enough to show you how, so far from being listless and sluggish, old age is ever a busy time, always doing and attempting something, of course of the same nature as each man's taste had been in the previous part of his life. Nay, do not some even add to their stock of learning? We see Solon, for instance, boasting his poems that he grows old, quote, daily learning something new, end quote. Or again in my own case, it was only when an old man that I became acquainted with Greek literature, which, in fact, I absorbed with such avidity in my yearning to quench, as it were, a long-continued thirst, that I became acquainted with the very facts which you now see me using as precedents. When I heard what Socrates had done about the lyre, I should have liked for my part to have done that too, for the ancients used to learn the lyre, but, at any rate, I worked hard at literature. Nor again do I now miss the bodily strength of a young man, for that was the second point as to the disadvantages of old age any more than as a young man I miss the strength of a bull or an elephant. You should use what you have, and at whatever you may chance to be doing, do it with all your might. What could be weaker than Milo of Croton's exclamation? When in his old age he was watching some athletes practicing in the course, he is said to have looked at his arms and to have exclaimed with tears in his eyes, Ah, well, these are now as good as dead. Not a bit more so than yourself, you trifler. For at no time were you made famous by your real self, 
but by the chest and biceps. Sextinius Aelius never gave vent to such a remark, nor, many years before him, Titus Coruncinanus, nor more recently P. Crassus. All of them learned jurist consults in active practice, whose knowledge of their profession was maintained to their last breath. I am afraid that an orator does lose vigor by old age, for his art is not a matter of the intellect alone, but of lungs and bodily strength. There was a rule that musical ring in the voice even gains in brilliance in a certain way as one grows old. Certainly, I have not yet lost it, and you see my years. Yet, after all, the style of speech suitable to an old man is the quiet and unemotional, and it often happens that the chastened and calm delivery of an old man eloquent secures a hearing. If you cannot attain that at yourself, you might still instruct the Scipio and Lelius, for what is more charming than old age surrounded by the enthusiasm of youth? Shall we not allow old age even the strength to teach the young, to train and equip them for all the duties of life? And what can be a nobler employment? For my part, I used to think Publius and Gnaeus Scipio and your two grandfathers, Aemilius and Africanus, fortunate men when I saw them with a company of young nobles about them. Nor should we think any teachers of the fine arts otherwise than happy, however much of their bodily forces may have decayed and failed. And yet that same failure of the body forces is more often brought about by the vices of youth than of old age, for a dissolute and intemperate youth hands down the body to old age in a worn-out state. Xenophon Cyrus, for instance, in his discourse delivered on his deathbed and at a very advanced age, says that he never perceived his old age to have become weaker than his youth had been. I remember as a boy Lucius Metellus, who, having been created Pontifex Maximus four years after his second consulship, held that office twenty-two years, enjoying such excellent strength to body in the very last hours of his life as to not miss his youth. I need not speak of myself, though that indeed is an old man's way and is generally allowed into my time of life. Don't you see in Homer how frequently Nestor talks of his own good qualities? For he was living through a third generation— nor had he any reason to fear that upon saying what was true about himself, he should appear either over vain or talkative. For as Homer says, quote, from his lips flowed discourse sweeter than honey, end quote, for which sweet breath he wanted no bodily strength. And yet, after all, the famous leader of the Greeks nowhere wishes to have ten men like Ajax, but like Nestor, if he could get them, he feels no doubt of Troy shortly falling. But to return to my own case, I am in my 84th year. I could wish that I had been able to make the same boast to Cyrus, but after all I can say this. I am not indeed as vigorous as I was as a private soldier in the Punic War, or as a quester in the same war, or as a consul in Spain, and four years later when as military tribune I took part in the engagement at Thermophili under the council Marcus Aesilus Glabrio. But yet, as you see, old age has not entirely destroyed my muscles, has not quite brought me to the ground. The Senate House does not find all my vigor gone, nor the rostra, nor my friends, nor my clients, nor my foreign guests. For I have never given in to that ancient and much praised proverb, Old when young is old for long. For myself, I had rather be an old man a somewhat shorter time than an old man before my time. Accordingly, no one up to the present has wished to see me to whom I have been denied as engaged. But, as it may be said, I have less strength than either of you. Neither have you the strength of the centurion T. Pontius. Is he the more eminent man on that account? Let there be only a proper husbanding of strength, and let each man proportion his efforts to his powers. Such a one will assuredly not be possessed with any great regret for his loss of strength. At Olympia, Milo is said to have stepped into the course carrying a live ox on his shoulders. Which, then, of the two would you prefer to have given to you? Bodily strength like that? or intellectual strength like that of Pythagoras. In fine, enjoy the blessing when you have it. When it is gone, don't wish it back. Unless we are to think that young men should wish their childhood back, and those somewhat older their youth. The course of life is fixed, and nature admits of it being run, but in one way, and only once, and to each part of our life there is something specially seasonable, so that the feebleness of children— as well as the high spirit of youth, the soberness of mature years, and the ripe wisdom of old age, all have a certain natural advantage which should be secured in its proper season. I think you are informed, Scipio, what your grandfather's foreign friend Massinissa does to this day, though ninety years old. 
When he has once begun a journey on foot, he does not mount his horse at all. When on horseback, he never gets off his horse. By no rain or cold can he be induced to cover his head. His body is absolutely free from unhealthy humors, and so he still performs all the duties and functions of a king. Active exercise, therefore, and temperance can preserve some part of one's former strength, even in old age. Bodily strength is wanting to old age, but neither is bodily strength demanded from old men. Therefore, both by law and custom, men of my time of life are exempt from those duties which cannot be supported without bodily strength. Accordingly, not only are we not forced to do what we cannot do, we are not even obliged to do as much as we can. But, it will be said, many old men are so feeble that they cannot perform any duty in life of any sort or kind. That is not a weakness to be set down as peculiar to old age. It is one shared by ill health. How feeble was the son of Africanus who adopted you? What weak health he had, or rather no health at all? If that had not been the case, we should have had him in a second brilliant light in political horizon, for he had added a wider cultivation to his father's greatness of spirit. What wonder, then, that old men are eventually feeble, when even the young cannot escape it? My dear Laelius and Scipio, we must stand up against old age and make up for its drawbacks by taking pains. We must fight it as we should an illness. We must look after our health, use moderate exercise, take just enough food and drink to recruit but not to overload our strength. Nor is it the body alone that must be supported, but the intellect and soul much more, for they are like lamps. Unless you feed them with oil, they too go out from old age. Again the body is apt to get gross from exercise, but the intellect becomes nimbler by exercising itself. For what Cecilius means by, quote, old daughters of the comic stage, end quote, are the credulous, the forgetful, and the slipshod. These are faults that do not attach to old age as such, but to a sluggish, spiritless, and sleepy old age. Young men are more frequently wanton and dissolute than old men. But yet, as it is not all young men that are so, but the bad set among them, even so senile folly usually called imbecility, applies to old men of unsound character, not to all. Appius governed four sturdy sons, five daughters, that great establishment, and all those clients, though he was both old and blind. For he kept his mind at full stretch like a bow, and never gave in to old age by growing slack. He maintained not merely an influence, but an absolute command over his family. His slaves feared him, his sons were in awe of him, all loved him. In that family, indeed, ancestral custom and discipline were in full vigor. The fact is that old age is respectable, just as long as it asserts itself, maintains its proper rights, and is not enslaved to anyone. For as I admire a young man who has something of the old man in him, so do I an old one who has something of a young man. The man who aims at this may possibly become old in body. In mind, he never will. I am now engaged in composing the seventh book of my origins, I collect all the records of antiquity. The speeches delivered in all celebrated cases which I have defended, I am at this particular time getting into shape for publication. I am writing treatises on augural, pontifical, and civil law. I am, besides, studying hard at Greek, and after the manner of the Pythagoreans, to keep my memory in working order, I repeat in the evening whatever I have said, heard, or done in the course of each day. These are the exercises of the intellect. These the training grounds of the mind. While I sweat and labor on these, I don't much feel the loss of bodily strength. I appear in court for my friends. I frequently attend the Senate and bring motions before it on my own responsibility, prepared after deep and long reflections. And these I support by my intellectual, not my bodily, forces. And if I were not strong enough to do these things, yet I should enjoy my sofa, imagining the very operations which I was now unable to perform. But what makes me capable of doing this is my past life. For a man who is always living in the midst of these studies and labors does not perceive when old age creeps up on him. Thus, by slow and imperceptible degrees, life draws to an end. There is no sudden breakage. It just slowly goes out. The third charge against old age is that it lacks sensual pleasures. What a splendid service does old age render if it takes from us the greatest blot of youth. Listen, my dear young friends, to a speech of Arcteus of Tarentum among the greatest and most illustrious of men, which was put into my hands when, as a young man, I was at Tarentum with Maximus. Quote, no or deadly cursed and sensual pleasure has been inflicted on mankind by nature, 
to gratify which our wanton appetites are roused beyond all prudence or restraint. It is a fruitful source of treasons, revolutions, secret communications with the enemy. In fact, there is no crime, no evil deed, to which the appetite for sensual pleasures does not impel us. Fornications and adulteries, and every abomination of that kind, are brought about by the enticements of pleasure and by them alone. Intellect is the best gift of nature or God. To this divine gift and endowment there is nothing so inimical as pleasure. For when appetite is our master, there is no place for self-control, nor where pleasure reigns supreme can virtue hold its ground. To see this more vividly, imagine a man excited to the highest conceivable pitch of sensual pleasure. It can be doubtful to know when that such a person, so long as under the influence of such excitation of the senses, will be unable to use to any purpose either intellect, reason, or thought. Therefore nothing can be so execrable, therefore nothing can be so execrable and so fatal as pleasure since, when more than ordinarily violent and lasting, it darkens all the light of the soul. End quote. These were the words addressed by Arcturus to the Samonite Gaius Pontius, father of the man by whom the consuls Spurius Postumus and Titus Veritarius were beaten in the Battle of Caudium. My friend Nercius of Tarentium, who had remained loyal to Rome, told me that he has heard them repeated by some old men, and that Plato the Athenian was present, who visited Tarentum, I find, in the consulship of Camillus and Appius Claudius, what is the point of all this? It is to show you that, if we were unable to scorn pleasure by the aid of reason and philosophy, we ought to have been very grateful to old age for depriving us of all inclination for that which it was wrong to do. For pleasure hinders thought, is a foe to reason, and so to speak, blinds the eyes of the mind. It is, moreover, entirely alien to virtue. I was sorry to have to expel Lucius, brother of the gallant Titius Flamininus from the Senate seven years after his consulship but I thought it imperative to affix a stigma on an act of gross sensuality. For when he was in Gaul as counsel, he had yielded to the entreaties of a paramour at a dinner party to behead a man who happened to be in prison condemned on a capital charge. When his brother Titus was censor, who preceded me, he escaped. But I and Flaccus could not countenance an act of such criminal and abandoned lust, especially as, besides the personal dishonor, it brought disgrace on the government. I have been told by men older than myself, who said that they have heard it as boys from older men, that Gaius Fabricius was in the habit of expressing astonishment at having heard, when envoy at the headquarters of King Pyrrhus, from the Thessalian Sinius, that there was a man of Athens who professed to be a philosopher, and who affirmed that everything we did was to be referred to as pleasure. When he told this to Manius Curius and Publius Decius, they used to remark that they wished that the Samnites and Pyrrhus himself would hold the same opinion. It would be much easier to conquer them if they had once given themselves over to sensual indulgence. Manius Curius had been intimate with Pedesius, who four years before the former's consulship had devoted himself to death for the Republic. Both Fabricius and Coruncanelius knew him also, and from the experience of their own lives, as well as from the action of Decius, they were of the opinion that there did exist something intrinsically noble and great, which was sought for its own sake and at which all the best men aimed to the contempt and neglect of pleasure. Why, then, do I spend so many words on the subject of pleasure? Why, because, far from being a charge against old age that it does not much feel the want of any pleasure, it is its highest praise. But, you will say, it is deprived of the pleasures of the table, the heaping up board, the rapid passing of the wine cup. Well, then, it is also free from headache, disorder digestion, broken sleep. But if we must grant pleasure something, since we do not find it easy to resist its charms, for Plato with happy inspiration calls pleasure vice's bait, because of course men are caught by it as a fish by a hook, yet although old age has to abstain from extravagant banquets, it is still capable of enjoying modest festivities. As a boy, I often used to see Gaius Dullius, the son of Marcus, then an old man, returning from a dinner party. He thoroughly enjoyed the frequent use of torch and flute player, distinctions which he had assumed, though unprecedented, in the case of a private person. It was the privilege of his glory. But why mention others? I will come back to my own case. To begin with, I have always remained a member of a club. Clubs, you know, were established in my kestership on reception of the Magna Mater from Ida. So I used to dine at their feast with members of my club, on the whole with moderation, though there was a certain warmth of temperamental natural in my time of life. But as that advances, there is a daily decrease of all excitement. 
Nor was I, in fact, ever wont to measure my enjoyment, even of these banquets, by the physical pleasures they gave more than by the gathering and conversation of friends. For it was a good idea of our ancestors to style the presence of guests at a dinner table, seeing that it implied a community of enjoyment, a convivium, a living together. It is a better term than the Greek words which mean a drinking together or an eating together for they would seem to give the preference to what is really the least important part of it. For myself, owing to the pleasure I take in conversation, I enjoy even banquets that begin early in afternoon, and not only in company with my contemporaries, of whom very few survive, but also with men of your age and with yourselves. I am thankful to old age, which has decreased my avidity for conversation, while it has removed that for eating and drinking. But if anyone does enjoy these, not to seem to have proclaimed war against all pleasure without exception, which is perhaps a feeling inspired by nature. I fail to perceive even in these very pleasures that old age is entirely without the power of appreciation. For myself, I take delight even in the old-fashioned appointment of master of the feast, and in the arrangement of the conversation, which according to ancestral custom is begun from the last place on the left-hand couch when the wine is brought in, and also in the cups which, as in Xenophon's banquet, are small and filled by driblets and in the contrivance for cooling in the summer and for warming in the winter sun or winter fire. These things I keep up even among my Sabian countrymen, and every day have a full dinner party of neighbors, which we prolong as far into the night as we can with varied conversation. But you may urge, there is not the same tingling sensation of pleasure in old men. No doubt. But neither do they miss it so much. For nothing gives you uneasiness which you do not miss. That was a fine answer of Sophocles to a man who asked him when in extreme old age whether he was still a lover. Heaven forbid, he replied. I was only too glad to escape from that, as though from a boorish and insane master. The men, indeed, who are keen after such things, it may possibly appear disagreeable and uncomfortable to be without them. But to jaded appetites, it is pleasanter to lack than to enjoy. However, he cannot be said to lack who does not want. My contention is not to want is a pleasanter thing. But even granting that youth enjoys these pleasures with more zest, in the first place they are insignificant things to enjoy, as I have said. And in the second place, such as age is not entirely without, if it does not possess them in profusion. Just as a man gets greater pleasure from ambivious terpio if seated in the front row of the theater than if he was in the blast, yet, after all, the man in the last row does get pleasure. So youth, because it looks at pleasure at close quarters, perhaps enjoys it more. Yet even old age, looking at them from a distance, does enjoy itself well enough. Why, what blessings are these, that the soul, having served its time, so to speak, in the campaigns of desire and ambition, rivalry and hatred, and all the passions— should live in its own thoughts, and, as the expression goes, should dwell apart. Indeed, if it has in store any of what I may call the food of study and philosophy, nothing can be pleasanter than an old age of leisure. We were witnesses to Gallius, the friend of your father Scipio, intent to the day of his death on mapping out the sky and land. How often did delight surprise him when still working on a problem begun during the night? How often did night find him busy on what he had begun at dawn? how he delighted in predicting for us solar and lunar eclipses long before they occurred. Or again, in studies of a lighter nature, though still requiring keenness of intellect, what a pleasure Nevius took in his Punic War, Platus in his Truculentus and Pseudolus. I even saw Livius Andronicus, who, having produced a play six years before I was born, in the consulship of Cinto and Tudantius, lived till I had become a young man. Why speak of Publius Licitius Crassus devoted to pontifical and civical law, or Publius Scipio at the present time? who within these last few days has been created Pontifex Maximus. And yet I have seen all whom I have mentioned ardent in these pursuits when old men. Then there is Marcus Cethegus, whom Aeneas just called, quote, Persuasion's Marrow, quote. With what enthusiasm did we see him exert himself in oratory even when quite old? What pleasure are there in feasts, games, or mistresses compared to the pleasures such as these? And they are all taste, too, connected with learning, which in men of sense and good education grow with their growth. It is indeed an honorable sentiment which Solon expresses in a verse, which I have quoted before, that he grew old learning many a fresh lesson every day. Than that intellectual pleasure, none certainly can be greater. 
I come now to the pleasures of the farmer, in which I take amazing delight. These are not hindered by any extent of old age, and seem to me to approach nearest the ideal wise man's life. For he has to deal with the earth, which never refuses its obedience, nor ever returns what it has received without usury, sometimes indeed with less, but generally with greater interest. For my part, however, it is not merely the thing produced, but the earth's own force and natural productiveness that delight me. For having received in its bosom the seeds scattered broadcast upon it, softened and broken up, she first keeps it concealed therein. Hence the harrowing which accomplishes this gets its name from a word meaning to hide. Next, when it has been warmed by her heat and close pressure, she splits it open and draws from it the greenery of the blade. This, supported by the fibers of the root, little by little grows up, and held upright by its jointed stalk is enclosed in sheets, as still being immature. When it has emerged from them, it produces an ear of corn arranged in order, and is defended against the pecking of the smaller birds by a regular palisade of spikes. Need I mention the starting, planting, and growing of vines? I can never have too much of this pleasure. To let you into the secret what gives my old age repose and amusement. For I say nothing here of the natural force which all things propagated from the earth possess, the earth from which that tiny grain in a fig, or the grapestone in a grape, or the most minute seeds of the other cereals and plants produces such huge trunks and boughs. Mallet, shoots, slips, cuttings, quicksets, layers, are they not enough to fill any one with delight and astonishment? The vine by nature is apt to fall, and unless supported, drops down to earth. Yet in order to keep itself upright, it embraces whatever it reaches with its tendrils as though they were hands. Then, as it creeps on, spreading itself in intricate and wild profusion, the dresser's art prunes it with a knife and prevents it growing a forest of shoots and expanding to excess in every direction. Accordingly, at the beginning of spring in the shoots which have been left there protrudes at each of the joints what is termed an eye. From this, the grape emerges and shows itself, which, swollen by the juice of the earth and heat of the sun, is at first very bitter to the taste, but afterward grows sweet as it matures, and being covered with tendrils is never without a moderate warmth, and yet is able to ward off the fiery heat of the sun. Can anything be richer in product or more beautiful to contemplate? It is not its utility only, as I said before, that charms me, but the method of its cultivation and the natural process of its growth, the rows of uprights, the cross pieces for the tops of the plants, the tying up of the vines and their propagation by layers, the pruning, to which I have already referred, of some shoots, the setting of others. I need hardly mention irrigation or trenching and digging the soil, which much increase its fertility. As to the advantages of manuring, I have spoken in my book of agriculture. The learned Hesiod did not say a single word on the subject, though he was writing on the cultivation of soil. Yet Homer, who in my opinion was many generations earlier, represents Laertes as softening his regret for his son by cultivating and manuring his farm. Nor is it only in cornfields and meadows and vineyards and plantations that a farmer's life is made cheerful. There are the garden and the orchard, the feeding of sheep, the swarms of bees, endless varieties of flowers. Nor is it only planting out that charms. There is also grafting, surely the most ingenious invention ever made by husbandmen. I might continue my list of the delights of country life, but even what I have said I think is somewhat overlong. However, you must pardon me, for farming is a very favorite hobby of mine, and old age is naturally rather garrulous. For I would not be thought to acquit it of all faults. Well, it was in a life of this sort that Manius Curious, after celebrating triumphs over the Samnites, the Sabines, and Pyrrhus, spent his last days. When I look at his villa, for it is not far from my own, I can never enough admire the man's own frugality or the spirit of the age. As Curious was sitting at his hearth, the Samnites, who brought him a large sum of gold, were repulsed by him. For it was not, he said, a fine thing in his eyes to possess gold, but to rule those who possessed it. Could such a high spirit fail to make old age pleasant? But to return to farmers, not to wander far from my own medier, in those days there were senators, that is, old men on their farms, for Cincinnatus was actually at the plow when word was brought to him that he had been named dictator. It was by his order as dictator, by the way, that Ahala, the master of the horse, seized and put to death Maelith when attempting to obtain royal power. Curious as well as other old men used to receive their summonses to attend a senate in their farmhouses, from which circumstances the summoners were called veateres, or travelers. 
Was this men's old age an object of pity who found their pleasure in the cultivation of the land? In my opinion, scarcely any life could be more blessed. Not alone from its utility, for agriculture is beneficial to the whole human race, but also as much from the mere pleasure of the thing, to which I have already alluded, and from the rich abundance and supply of all things necessary for the food of man and for the worship of the gods above. So, as these are objects of desire to certain people, let us make our peace with pleasure. For the good and hard-working farmer's wine cellar and oil store, as well as his larder, are always well filled, and his whole farmhouse is richly furnished. It abounds in pigs, goats, lambs, fowls, milk, cheese, and honey. Then there is the garden, which the farmers themselves called their second flitch. A zest and flavor is added to all these by hunting and fowling in spare hours. Need I mention the greenery of meadows, the rows of trees, the beauty of the vineyard and olive grove? I will but put it briefly. Nothing can either furnish necessities more richly or present a fairer spectacle than well-cultivated land. And to the enjoyment of that, old age does not merely present no hindrance. It actually invites and allures to it. For where else can it better warm itself, either by basking in the sun, or by sitting by the fire, or at the proper time cool itself more wholesomely, by the help of shade and water? Let the young keep their arms then to themselves, their horses, spears, their foils and ball, their swimming baths and running path. To us old men, let them, out of the many forms of sport, leave dice and counters. But even that, as they choose, since old age can be quite happy without them. Xenophon's books are very useful for many purposes. Pray go on reading them with attention, as you have ever done. In what ample terms is agriculture lauded by him in the book about husbanding and one's property, which is called economics, but to show you that he thought nothing so worthy of a prince as the taste for cultivating the soil, I will translate what Socrates says to Critobulus in that book. When that most gallant Lacedaemonian Lysander came to visit the Persian prince Cyrus at Sardis, so eminent for his character and the glory of his rule, bringing him presents from his allies, he treated Lysander in all ways with courteous familiarity and kindness, and, among other things, took him to see a certain park carefully planted. Lysander expressed admiration of the height of the trees and the exact arrangement of the rows in the quincunix, the careful cultivation of the soil, its freedom from weeds, and the sweetness of the odors exhaled from the flowers, and went on to say that what he admired was not the industry only, but also the skill of the man by whom this had been planned and laid out. Cyrus replied, Well, it was I who planted the whole thing. These rows are my doing, and laying out is all mine. Many of the trees were even planted by my own hand. Then Lysander, looking at his purple robe, the brilliance of his person, and the adornment Persian fashion with gold and many jewels, said, People are quite right, Cyrus, to call you happy, since the advantages of high fortune have been joined to an excellence like yours. This kind of good fortune, then, it is in the power of old men to enjoy nor is age any bar to our maintaining pursuits of every other kind, and especially of agriculture, to the very extreme verge of old age. For instance, we have it on record that Valerius Corvus kept it up to his hundredth year, living on his land and cultivating after his active career was over, though between his first and sixth consulships there was an interval of six and forty years. So that he had an official career lasting the number of years which our ancestors defined as coming between birth and the beginning of old age. Moreover, that last period of his old age was more blessed than that of his middle life, inasmuch as he had greater influence and less labor. For the crowning grace of old age is influence. How great was that of Celius Medalis! How great that of Attilus Calatinus, over whom the famous epitaph was placed! Very many classes agree in deeming this to have been the very first man of the nation. The line cut on his tomb is well known. It is natural, then, that a man should have had influence, in whose praise the verdict of history is unanimous. Again, in recent times, what a great man was Publius Crassus, Pontifex Maximus, and his successor in the same office, M. Lepidus. I need scarcely mention Paulus or Africanus, or as I did before Maximus. It was not only their senatorial utterances that had weight, their least gesture had it also. In fact, old age, especially when it has enjoyed honors, has an influence worth all the pleasures of youth put together. But throughout my discourse, remember that my panegyric applies to an old age that has been established on foundations laid by youth, from which may be deduced what I once said with universal applause, 
that it was a wretched old age that had to defend itself by speech. Neither white hairs nor wrinkles can at once claim influence in themselves. It is the honorable conduct of earlier days that is rewarded by possessing influence at the last. Even things generally regarded as trifling in matters of course, being saluted, being courted, having way made for one, people rising when one approaches, being escorted to and from the forum, being referred to for advice, all these are marks of respect, observed among us and in other states, always most sedulously where the moral tone is highest. They say that Lysander the Spartan, who I mentioned before, used to remark that Sparta was the most dignified home for old age, for that nowhere was more respect paid to years, nowhere was old age held in higher honor. Nay, the story is told of how when a man advanced in years came into the theater at Athens when the games were going on, no place was given him anywhere in that large assembly by his own countrymen. But when he came near the Lacedaemonians, who as ambassadors had a fixed place assigned to them, they rose as one man out of respect for him and gave the veteran a seat. When they were greeted with rounds of applause from the whole audience, one of them remarked, The Athenians know what is right, but will not do it. There are many excellent rules in our augural college, but among the best is one which affects our subject. That precedence in speech goes by seniority, and augurs who are older are preferred not only to those who have held higher office, but even to those who are actually in possession of imperium. What, then, are the physical pleasures to be compared with the reward of influence? Those who have employed it with distinction appear to me have played the drama of life to its end, and not to have broken down in the last act like unpracticed players. But, it will be said, old men are fretful, fidgety, ill-tempered, and disagreeable. If you come to that, they are also avaricious. But these are faults of character, not of the time of life. And, after all, fretfulness and the other faults I mentioned admits of some excuse, not indeed a complete one, but one that may possibly pass muster. They think themselves neglected, looked down upon, mocked. Besides, with bodily weakness every rub is a source of pain. Yet all these faults are softened by both good character and good education. Illustrations of this may be found in real life, as also on the stage in the case of the brothers in Adelphi. What harshness in the one, what gracious manners in the other. The fact is that, just as it is not every wine, so it is not every life that turns sour from keeping. Serious gravity I approve of in old age, but, as in other things, it must be within due limits. Bitterness I can in no case approve. What the object of senile avarice may be I cannot conceive. For can there be anything more absurd than to seek more journey money the less there remains of the journey? There remains the fourth reason, which more than anything else appears to torment men of my age and keep them in a flutter. The nearness of death, which it must be allowed cannot be far from an old man. But what a poor dotard must he be who has not learnt in the course of so long a life that death is not a thing to be feared. Death, that is either to be totally disregarded, if it entirely extinguishes the soul, or is even to be desired if it brings him where he is to exist forever. The third alternative, at any rate, cannot possibly be discovered. Why then should I be afraid if I am destined either not to be miserable after death, or even to be happy? After all, who was such a fool as to feel certain? however young he may be, that he will be alive in the evening. Nay, that time of life has many more chances of death than ours. Young men more easily contract diseases, their illnesses are more serious, their treatment has to be more severe. Accordingly, only a few arrive at old age. If that were not so, life would be conducted better and more wisely. For it is in old men that thought, reason, and prudence are to be found. And if there had been no old men, states would never have existed at all. But I return to the subject of the imminence of death. What sort of charge is this against old age, when you see that it is shared by youth? I had reason, in the case of my excellent son, as you had Scipio, and that of your brothers, who were expected to attain the highest honors, to realize that death is common to every time of life. Yes, you will say, but a young man expects to live long. An old man cannot expect to do so. Well, he is a fool to expect it. For what can be more foolish than to regard the uncertain as certain, the false as true? An old man has nothing even to hope. Ah, but it is just there that he is in a better position than a young man, since what the latter only hopes he has obtained. The one wishes to live long, 
the other has lived long. And yet, good heavens, what is long in a man's life? For grant the utmost limit, let us expect an age like that of the king of Tartessi. For there was, as I find recorded, a certain Agonius Agades who reigned eighty years and lived a hundred and twenty. But to my mind, nothing seems even long in which there is any last, for when that arrives, then all the past has slipped away. Only that remains to which you have attained by virtue and righteous actions. Hours indeed, and days, and month, and years depart. Nor does past time ever return, nor can the future be known. Whatever time each is granted for life, with that he is bound to be content. An actor, in order to earn approval, is not bound to perform a play from the beginning to end. Let him only satisfy the audience of whatever act he appears. Nor need a wise man go on to the concluding plaudite. For a short term of life is long enough for living well and honorably. But if you go farther, you have no more right to grumble than farmers do because the charm of the spring season is past and the summer of autumn have come. For the word spring in a way suggests youth and points to the harvest to be. The other seasons are suited for the reaping and storing of the crops. Now the harvest of old ages, as I have often said, the memory and rich store of blessings laid up in earlier life. Again, all things that accord with nature are to be counted as good. But what can be more in accordance with nature than for old men to die? A thing indeed which also befalls young men, though nature revolts and fights against it. Accordingly, the death of young men seems to me like putting out a great fire with a deluge of water. But old men die like a fire going out because it is burnt down of its own nature without artificial means. Again, just as apples when unripe are torn from trees, but when ripe and mellow drop down. So it is violence that takes the life from young men, ripeness from old. This ripeness is so delightful to me that, as I approach nearer to death, I seem, as it were, to be sighting land and to be coming to port at last after a long voyage. Again, there is no fixed borderline for old age, and you are making a good and proper use of it as long as you can satisfy the call of duty and disregard death. The result of this is that old age is even more confident and courageous than youth. That is the meaning of Solon's answer to the Tyrus Pisistratus. When the latter asked him what he relied upon in opposing him with such boldness, he is said to have replied, On my old age... But that end of life is the best when, without the intellect or senses being impaired, nature herself takes to pieces her own handiwork, which she also put together. Just as the builder of a ship or a house can break them up more easily than anyone else, so the nature that knit together the human frame can also best unfasten it. Moreover, a thing freshly glued together is always difficult to pull asunder. If old, this is easily done. The result is that the short time of life left to them is not to be grasped at by old men with greedy eagerness or abandoned without cause. Pythagoras forbids us, without an order from our commander, that is God, to desert life fortress and outpost. Solon's epitaph, indeed, is that of a wise man, in which he says that he does not wish his death to be unaccompanied by the sorrow of lamentations of friends. He wants, I suppose, to be beloved by them. But I rather think Ennius says it better. None grace me with their tears, nor weeping loud, make sad my funeral rites. He holds that a death is not a subject for mourning, when it is followed by immortality. Again, there may possibly be some sensation of dying, and that only for a short time, especially in the case of an old man, after death, indeed. Sensation is either what one would desire, or it disappears altogether. But to disregard death is a lesson which must be studied from our youth up, for unless that is learnt, no one can have a quiet mind. For die we certainly must, and that too without being certain whether it may not be at this very day. A death, therefore, is hanging over our head every hour. How can a man ever be unshaken in soul if he fears it? But on this theme, I don't think I need much enlarge. When I remember what Lucius Brutus did, who was killed while defending his country, or the two Decii who spurred their horses to a gallop and met a voluntary death, or Attilius Regulus, who left his home to confront a death of torture, rather than break the word which he had pledged to the enemy, or the two Scipios, who determined to block the Carthaginian advance even with their own bodies, or your grandfather, Lucius Paulus, who paid with his life for the rations of his colleagues in the disgrace at Cani, 
or Marcellus, whose death not even the most bloodthirsty of enemies would allow to go without the honor of burial. It is enough to recall that our legions, as I have recorded in my origins, have often marched with cheerful and lofty spirit to ground from which they believe they would never return. That, therefore, which young men, not only uninstructed but absolutely ignorant, treat as of no account, shall men who are neither young nor ignorant shrink from in terror? As a general truth, as it seems to me, it is weariness of all pursuits that creates weariness of life. There are certain pursuits adapted to childhood. Do young men miss them? There are others suited to early manhood. Does that settled time of life called middle age ask for them? There are others, again, suited to that age, but not look for an old age. There are, finally, some which belong to old age. Therefore, as the pursuit of the earlier ages have their time for disappearing, so also those of old age. And when that takes place, satiety of life brings on the ripe time for death. For I do not see why I should not venture to tell you my personal opinion as to death, of which I see myself to have a clearer vision in proportion as I am nearer to it. I believe, Scipio and Laelius, that your fathers, those illustrious men and my dearest friends, are still alive, and that too with a life which alone deserves the name. For as long as we are imprisoned in this framework of the body, we perform a certain function and laborious work assigned us by fate. The soul, in fact, is of heavenly origin, forced down from its home in the highest, and, so to speak, buried in earth, a place quite opposed to its divine nature and its immortality. But I suppose the immortal gods to have sown souls broadcast in human bodies, that there might be some to survey the world, and while contemplating the order of the heavenly bodies to imitate it in the unvarying regularity of their life. Nor is it only reason and arguments that have brought me to this belief, but the great fame and authority of the most distinguished philosophers. I used to be told that Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans, almost natives of our country, who in old times had been called the Italian school of philosophers, never doubted that we had souls drafted from the universal divine intelligence. I used besides to have pointed out to me the discourse delivered by Socrates on the last day of his life upon the immortality of the soul. Socrates! who was pronounced by the oracle at Delphi to be the wisest of men. I need say no more. I have convinced myself, and I hold, in the view of the rapid movement of the soul, its vivid memory of the past and its prophetic knowledge of the future, its many accomplishments, its vast range of knowledge, its numerous discoveries, that a nature embracing such varied gifts cannot itself be mortal. And since the soul is always in motion, and yet has no external source of motion, for it is self-moved, I conclude again that it will also have no end to its motion, because it is not likely ever to abandon itself. Again, since the nature of the soul is not composite, nor has in it any admixture that is not homogeneous and similar, I conclude that it is indivisible, and, if indivisible, that it cannot perish. It is again a strong proof of men knowing most things before birth, that when mere children they grasp innumerable facts with such speed as to show that they are not then taking them in for the first time, but remembering and recalling them. This is roughly Plato's argument. Once more in Xenophon, we have the elder Cyrus on his deathbed speaking as follows. Do not suppose, my dearest sons, that when I have left you I shall be nowhere and no one. Even when I was with you, you did not see my soul, but knew it was in this body of mine from what I did. Believe, then, that it is still the same, even though you see it not. The honors paid to illustrious men had not continued to exist after their death. Had the souls of these very men not done something to make us retain our recollection of them beyond the ordinary time? For myself, I never could be persuaded that soul while in mortar bodies were alive and died directly they left them, nor in fact that the soul only lost all intelligence when it left the unintelligent body. I believe rather than when, by being liberated from all corporeal admixture, it has begun to be pure and undefiled. It is then that it becomes wise. And again, when a man's natural frame is resolved into its elements by death, it is clearly seen whither each of the other elements departs. For they all go to the place from which they came, but the soul alone is invisible alike when present and when departing. Once more, you see that nothing is so like death as sleep, and yet it is in sleepers that souls most clearly revive in their divine nature, for they foresee many events, when they are allowed to escape and are left free. This shows what they are likely to be when they have completely freed themselves from the fetters of body. Wherefore, if these things are so, obey me as a god. 
But if my soul is to perish with my body, nevertheless do you from awe of the gods who guard and govern this fair universe preserve my memory by the loyalty and piety of your lives. Such are the words of the dying Cyrus. I will now, with your good leave, look at home. No one, my dear Scipio, shall ever persuade me that your father, Paulus, and your two grandfathers, Paulus and Africanus, or the father of Africanus, or his uncle, or many other illustrious men not necessary to mention, would have attempted such lofty deeds as to be remembered by posterity, had they not seen in their minds that the future ages concerned them. Do you suppose, to take an old man privilege of little self-praise, that I should have been likely to undertake such heavy labors by day and night at home and abroad, if I had been destined to have the same limit to my glory as to my life? Had it not been much better to pass an age of ease and repose without any labor or exertion? But my soul, I know not how, refusing to be kept down, ever fixed its eyes upon future ages, as though from a conviction that it would begin to live only when it had left the body. But had it not been cast that souls were immortal, it would not have been the souls of all the best men that made the greatest efforts after an immortality of fame. Again, is there not the fact that the wisest man ever dies with the greatest cheerfulness and the most unwise with the least? Don't you think that the soul which has the clearer and longer sight sees that it is starting for better things, while the soul whose vision is dimmer does not see it? For my part, I am transported with the desire to see your fathers, who are the object of my reverence and affection. Nor is it only those whom I knew that I longed to see. It is those also of whom I have been told and have read, whom I have myself recorded in my history. When I am setting out for that, there is certainly no one who will find it easy to draw me back or boil me up again like second Pelios. Nay, if some god should grant me to renew my childhood from my present age and once more to be crying in my cradle, I would firmly refuse. Nor should I be in truth willing after having, as it were, run the full course, to be recalled from the winning crease to the barriers. For what blessings has life to offer? Should we not rather say what labor? But granting that it has, at any rate, it has after all a limit either to enjoyment or to existence. I don't wish to depreciate life, as many men and good philosophers have often done, nor do I regret having lived, for I have done so in a way that lets me think that I was not born in vain. But I quit life as I would an inn, not as I would a home, for nature has given us a place of entertainment, not of residence. O oh, glorious day, when I shall set out to join that heavenly conclave and company of souls, and depart from the turmoil and purities of this world, for I shall not go to join only those who I have before mentioned, but also my son Cato, than whom no better band was never born, nor one more conspicuous for piety. His body was burnt by me, though mine ought, on the contrary, to have been burnt by him. But his spirit, not abandoning, but ever looking back upon me, has certainly gone whither he saw that I too must come. I was thought to bear that loss heroically. Not that I really bore it without distress, but I found my own consolation in the thought that the parting and separation between us was not to be for long. It is by these means, my dear Scipio, for you said to you and Lady were wont to express a prize on this point, that my old age sits lightly on me, and is not only not oppressive, but even delightful. But if I am wrong in thinking the human soul immortal, I am glad to be wrong. Nor will I allow the mistake which gives me so much pleasure to be wrested from me as long as I live. But if when dead, as some insignificant philosophers think I am to be without sensation, I am not afraid of dead philosophers deriding my errors. Again, if we are not to be immortal, it is nevertheless what a man must wish, to have his life end at the proper time. For nature puts a limit to living, as to everything else. Now, old age is, as it were, the playing out of the drama, the full fatigue of which we should shun, especially when we also feel that we have had more than enough of it. This is all I had to say on old age. I pray that you may arrive at it, that you may put my words to a practical test. End of On Old Age by Cicero Read by M. L. Cohen Mojomove411.com that's M-O-J-O-M-O-V-E 411.com, Cleveland, Ohio, September 2007.
To Atticus at Athens, Rome, July, by Marcus Tullius Cicero, translated by Evelyn Shirley Schuckberg. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The state of things in regard to my candidature, in which I know that you are supremely interested, is this, as far as can be as yet conjectured. The only person actually canvassing is P. Supposius Galba. He meets with a good old-fashioned refusal, without reserve or disguise. In the general opinion this premature canvass of his is not unfavorable to my interests, for the voters generally give as a reason for their refusal that they are under obligations to me. So I hope my prospects are, to a certain degree, improved by the report getting about that my friends are found to be numerous. My intention was to begin my own canvass just at the very time that Cincius tells me that your servant starts with this letter, namely, in the campus at the time of the Tribuncian elections of the 17th of July. My fellow candidates, to mention only those who seem certain, are Galba and Antonius and Q. Cornificius. At this I imagine you smiling or sighing. Well, to make you positively smite your forehead, there are people who actually think that Caesonius will stand. I don't think Aquilius will, for he openly disclaims it, and has alleged as an excuse his health and his leading position at the bar. Catiline will certainly be a candidate, if you can imagine a jury finding that the sun does not shine at noon. As for Ophidius and Pallicanus, I don't think you will expect to hear from me about them. Of the candidates for this year's election, Caesar is considered certain. Thermus is looked upon as the rival of Silenus. These latter are so weak, both in friends and reputation, that it seems past impossible to bring in curious over their heads. But no one else thinks so. What seems most to my interest is that Thermus should get in with Caesar, for there is none of those at present canvassing who, if left over to my year, seem likely to be a stronger candidate from the fact that he is commissioner of the Via Flaninia, and when that has been finished, I shall be greatly relieved to have seen him elected consul this election. Such in outline is the position of affairs in regard to candidates up to date. For myself, I shall take the greatest pains to carry out all the duties of a candidate and perhaps, as Gaul seems to have a considerable voting power, as soon as business at Rome has come to a standstill, I shall obtain a libera legatio, and make an excursion in the course of September, to visit Piso, but so as not to be back later than January. When I have ascertained the feelings of the nobility, I will write you word. Everything else, I hope, will go smoothly, at any rate, while my competitors are such as are now in town. You must undertake to secure for me the entourage of our friend Pompey, since you are nearer than I. Tell him I shall not be annoyed if he doesn't come to my election. So much for that business. But there is a matter for which I am very anxious that you should forgive me. Your uncle Cecilius having been defrauded of a large sum of money by P. Varius, began an action against his cousin, A. Caninius Satyrus, for the property which, as he alleged, the latter has received from Varius by a collusive sale. He was joined in this action by the other creditors, among whom were Lucullus and P. Scipio, and the man whom they thought would be official re receiver if the property was put up for sale, Lucius Pontius. 
though it is ridiculous to be talking about a receiver at this stage in the proceedings. Cecilius asked me to appear for him against Satyrus. Now, scarcely a day passes that Satyrus does not call at my house. The chief object of his attention is L. Domitius, but I am next in his regard. He has been of great service both to myself and to my brother Quintus in our elections. I was very much embarrassed by my intimacy with Satyrus, as well as with that of Domitius, on whom the success of my election depends more than on any one else. I pointed out these facts to Cecilius. At the same time I assured him that if the case had been one exclusively between himself and Satyrus, I would have done what he wished. As the matter actually stood, all the creditors being concerned, and that two men of the highest rank, who, without the aid of any one specially retained by Cecilius, would have no difficulty in maintaining their common cause. It was only fair that he should have consideration both for my private friendship and my present situation. He seemed to take this somewhat less courteously than I could have wished, or than is usual among gentlemen, and from that time forth he has entirely withdrawn from the intimacy with me which was only a few days standing. Pray forgive me, and believe that I was prevented by nothing but natural kindness from assailing the reputation of a friend in so vital a point at a time of such very great distress, considering that he had shewn me every sort of kindness and attention. But if you incline to the harsher view of my conduct, take it that the interests of my canvas prevented me. Yet, even granting that to be so, I think you should pardon me. Quote, Since not for sacred beast or oxide shield, unquote. you see, in fact, the position I am in, and how necessary I regard it, not only to retain, but even to acquire all possible sources of popularity. I hope I have justified myself in your eyes. I am at any rate anxious to have done so. The Hermathena you sent I am delighted with. It has been placed with such charming effect that the whole gymnasium seems arranged specially for it. I am exceedingly obliged to you. End of To Atticus at Athens by Marcus Tullius Cicero Reading by Bologna Times Section 20 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 20. Of the Offices of Literature and Poetry, from the oration for the poet Archaeus, and honors proposed for the dead statesman Sulpicius, from the Ninth Philippic, by Cicero. Of the offices of literature and poetry, from the oration for the poet Archaeus. You ask us, O Gratius, why we are so exceedingly attached to this man, because he supplies us with food whereby our mind is refreshed after this noise in the forum and with rest for our ears after they have been wearied with bad language. Do you think it possible that we could find a supply for our daily speeches when discussing such a variety of matters, unless we were to cultivate our minds by the study of literature, or that our minds could bear being kept so constantly on the stretch if we did not relax them by that same study? But I confess that I am devoted to those studies. Let others be ashamed of them if they have buried themselves in books, without being able to produce anything out of them for the common advantage, or anything which may bear the eyes of men and the light. But why need I be ashamed, who for many years have lived in such a manner as never to allow my own love of tranquillity to deny me to the necessity or advantage of another, 
or my fondness for pleasure to distract, or even sleep to delay, my attention to such claims. Who then can reproach me, or who has any right to be angry with me, if I allow myself as much time for the cultivation of these studies as some take for the performance of their own business, or for celebrating days of festival and games, or for other pleasures, or even for the rest and refreshment of mind and body, or, as others devote to early banquets, to playing at dice or at ball. And this ought to be permitted to me, because by these studies my power of speaking and those faculties are improved, which, as far as they do exist in me, have never been denied to my friends when they have been in peril. And if that ability appears to any one to be but moderate, at all events I know whence I derive those principles which are of the greatest value. For if I had not persuaded myself from my youth upwards, both by the precepts of many masters and by much reading, that there is nothing in life greatly to be desired except praise and honor, and that while pursuing those things all tortures of the body, all dangers of death and banishment are to be considered but of small importance, I should never have exposed myself in defense of your safety to such numerous and arduous contests and to these daily attacks of profligate men. But all books are full of such precepts, and all the sayings of philosophers and all antiquity are full of precedents teaching the same lesson. But all these things would lie buried in darkness if the light of literature and learning were not applied to them. How many images of the bravest men, carefully elaborated, have both the Greek and Latin writers bequeathed to us, not merely for us to look at and gaze upon, but also for our imitation. And I, always keeping them before my eyes as examples for my own public conduct, have endeavored to model my mind and views by continually thinking of those excellent men. Someone will ask, what, were those identical great men, whose virtues have been recorded in books, accomplished in all that learning which you are extolling so highly? It is difficult to assert this of all of them, but still I know what answer I can make to that question. I admit that many men have existed of admirable disposition and virtue, who, without learning, by the almost divine instinct of their own mere nature, have been, of their own accord as it were, moderate and wise men. I even add this, that very often nature without learning has had more to do with leading men to credit and to virtue than learning when not assisted by a good natural disposition. And I also contend that when to an excellent and admirable natural disposition there is added a certain system and training of education, then from that combination arises an extraordinary perfection of character, such as is seen in that godlike man whom our fathers saw in their time, Africanus, and in Caius Lelius and Lucius Furius, most virtuous and moderate men, and in that most excellent man, the most learned man of his time, Marcus Cato the Elder. And all these men, if they had been to derive no assistance from literature in the cultivation and practice of virtue, would never have applied themselves to the study of it. Though even if there were no such great advantage to be reaped from it, and if it were only pleasure that is sought from these studies, still I imagine you would consider it a most reasonable and liberal employment of the mind for other occupations are not suited to every time, nor to every age or place, but these studies are the food of youth, the delight of old age, the ornament of prosperity, the refuge and comfort of adversity, a delight at home, and no hindrance abroad. They are companions by night, and in travel, and in the country. And if we ourselves were not able to arrive at these advantages, nor even taste them with our senses, Still, we ought to admire them even when we saw them in others, and indeed we have constantly heard from men of the greatest eminence and learning that the study of other sciences was made up of learning and rules and regular method, but that a poet was such by the unassisted work of nature, and was moved by the vigor of his own mind, and was inspired, as it were, by some divine wrath. Wherefore rightly does our own great Aeneas call poets holy, because they seem to be recommended to us by some especial gift, as it were, and liberality of the gods. Let, then, judges, this name of poet, this name which no barbarians even have ever disregarded, be holy in your eyes, men of cultivated minds as you all are. Rocks and deserts reply to the poet's voice. Savage beasts are often moved and arrested by song. 
and shall we who have been trained in the pursuit of the most virtuous acts refuse to be swayed by the voice of poets the colophonians say that homer was their citizen the cayennes claim him as theirs the salaminians assert their right to him but the men of smyrna loudly assert him to be a citizen of smyrna and they have even raised a temple to him in their city many other places also fight with one another for the honor of being his birthplace they then claim a stranger even after his death because he was a poet shall we reject this man while he is alive a man who by his own inclination and by our laws does actually belong to us especially when archaeus has employed all his genius with the utmost zeal in celebrating the glory and renown of the roman people for when a young man he touched on our wars against the cimbri and gained the favor even of caius marius himself a man who was tolerably proof against this sort of study for there was no one so disinclined to the muses as not willingly to endure that the praise of his labors should be made immortal by means of verse they say that the great themistocles the greatest man that athens produced said when someone asked him what sound or whose voice he took the greatest delight in hearing the voice of that by whom his own exploits were best celebrated therefore the great marius was also exceedingly attached to lucius plosius because he thought that the achievement which he had performed could be celebrated by his genius and the whole mithridatic war great and difficult as it was and carried on with so much diversity of fortune by land and sea has been related at length by him and the books in which that is sung of not only make illustrious lucius lucullus that most gallant and celebrated man but they do honor also to the roman people for while lucullus was general the roman people opened pontus though it was defended both by the resources of the king and by the character of the country itself under the same general the army of the roman people with no very great numbers routed the countless hosts of the armenians it is the glory of the roman people that by the wisdom of that same general the city of the Cyzacenes, most friendly to us was delivered and preserved from all the attacks of the kind and from the very jaws as it were of the whole war ours is the glory which will be forever celebrated which is derived from the fleet of the enemy which was sunk after its admirals had been slain and from the marvellous naval battle off tenedos those trophies belong to us those monuments are ours those triumphs are ours therefore i say that the men by whose genius these exploits are celebrated make illustrious at the same time the glory of the roman people our countryman aeneas was dear to the elder africanus and even on the tomb of the scipios his effigy is believed to be visible carved in the marble but undoubtedly it is not only the men who are themselves praised who are done honor to by these praises but the name of the roman people also is adorned by them cato the ancestor of this cato is extolled to the skies great honor is paid to the exploits of the roman people lastly all those great men the maximi the marcelli and the fulvi are done honor to not without all of us having also a share in the panegyric certainly if the mind had no anticipations of posterity and if it were to confine all its thoughts within the same limits as those by which the space of our lives is bounded it would neither break itself with such severe labors nor would it be tormented with such cares and sleepless anxiety nor would it so often have to fight for its very life at present there is a certain virtue in every good man which night and day stirs up the mind with the stimulus of glory and reminds it that all mention of our name will not cease at the same time with our lives but that our fame will endure to all posterity do we all who are occupied in the affairs of the state and who are surrounded by such perils and dangers in life appear to be so narrow-minded as though to the last moment of our lives we have never passed one tranquil or easy moment to think that everything will perish at the same time as ourselves ought we not when many most illustrious men have with great care collected and left behind them statues and images representations not of their minds but of their bodies much more to desire to leave behind us a copy of our counsels and of our virtues wrought and elaborated by the greatest genius 
I thought, at the very moment of performing them, that I was scattering and disseminating all the deeds which I was performing, all over the world, for the eternal recollection of nations. And whether that delight is to be denied to my soul after death, or whether, as the wisest men have thought, it will affect some portion of my spirit, at all events I am at present delighted with some such idea and hope. Honors proposed for the dead statesman Sulpicius, from the ninth Philippic. Our ancestors, indeed, decreed statues to many men, public sepulchres to few. But statues perish by weather, by violence, by lapse of time. The sanctity of the sepulchres is in the soil itself, which can neither be moved nor destroyed by any violence. And while other things are extinguished, so sepulchres become holier by age. Let then this man be distinguished by that honor also, a man to whom no honor can be given which is not deserved. Let us be grateful in paying respect in death to him to whom we can now show no other gratitude, and by that same step let the audacity of Marcus Antonius, waging a nefarious war, be branded with infamy. For when these honors have been paid to Servius Sulpicius, the evidence of his embassy having been insulted and rejected by Antonius will remain for everlasting. On which account I give my vote for a decree in this form as Servius Sulpicius Rufus, the son of Quintus, of the Lemonian tribe, at a most critical period of the Republic, and being ill with a very serious and dangerous disease, preferred the authority of the Senate and the safety of the Republic to his own life, and struggled against the violence and severity of his illness, in order to arrive at the camp of Antonius, to which the Senate had sent him, and as he, when he had almost arrived at the camp, being overwhelmed by the violence of the disease, has lost his life in discharging a most important office of the Republic, and as his death has been in strict correspondence to a life passed with the greatest integrity and honor, during which he, Servius Sulpicius, has often been of great service to the Republic, both as a private individual and in the discharge of various magistracies, and as he, being such a man, has encountered death on behalf of the Republic while employed on an embassy, the Senate decrees that a brazen pedestrian statue of Servius Sulpicius be erected in the rostra in compliance with the resolution of this order, and that his children and posterity shall have a place round this statue of five feet in every direction, from which to behold the games and gladiatorial combats, because he died in the cause of the Republic and that this reason be inscribed on the pedestal of this statue, and that Caius Pansa and Aulus Hirsius, the consuls, one or both of them, if it seem good to them, shall command the quaestors of the city to let out a contract for making that pedestal and that statue, and erecting them in the rostra, and that whatever price they contract for, they shall take care the amount is given and paid to the contractor." and as in old times the Senate has exerted its authority with respect to the obsequies of, and honors paid to brave men, it now decrees that he shall be carried to the tomb on the day of his funeral with the greatest possible solemnity. And as Servius Sulpicius Rufus, the son of Quintus of the Lemonian tribe, has deserved so well the Republic as to be entitled to be complimented with all those distinctions, the Senate is of the opinion and thinks it for the advantage of the Republic, that the curial edile should suspend the edict which usually prevails with respect to funerals, in the case of the funeral of Servius Sulpicius Rufus, the son of Quintus of the Lemonian tribe, and that Caius Panza, the consul, shall assign him a place for a tomb in the Esquiline Plain, or in whatever place shall seem good to him, extending thirty feet in every direction, where Servius Sulpicius may be buried, and that that shall be his tomb, and that of his children and posterity, as having been a tomb most deservedly given to them by the public authority. End of section 20. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 21 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. Section 21. 
Selected Excerpts from the Dialogues of Cicero Old Friends Better Than New From the Dialogue on Friendship But there arises on this subject a somewhat difficult question, whether ever new friends, if deserving friendship, are to be preferred to old ones, just as we are wont to prefer young colts to old horses, a perplexity unworthy of a man, for there ought to be no satiety of friendship as of other things, Everything which is oldest, as those wines which bear age well, ought to be sweetest, and that is true which is sometimes said, many bushels of salt must be eaten together, before the duty of friendship can be fulfilled. But new friendships, if they afford a hope that, as in the case of plants which never disappoint, fruits shall appear, such are not to be rejected. Yet the old one must be preserved in its proper place, for the power of age and custom is exceedingly great. Besides, in the very case of the horse which I just mentioned, if there is no impediment, there is no one who does not more pleasurably use that to which he is accustomed, than one unbroken and strange to him. And habit asserts its power, and habit prevails, not only in the case of this, which is animate, but also in the cases of those things which are inanimate, since we take delight in the very mountainous or woody scenery among which we have long dwelt. Honored Old Age from the Dialogue on Old Age. But in my whole discourse, remember that I am praising that old age which is established on the foundations of youth, from which this is effected, which I once asserted with the great approbation of all present, that wretched was the old age which had to defend itself by speaking. Neither gray hairs nor wrinkles can suddenly catch respect, but the former part of life honorably spent reaps the fruits of authority at the close. For these very observances, which seem light and common, are marks of honor, to be saluted, to be sought after, to receive precedence, to have persons rising up to you, to be attended on the way, to be escorted home, to be consulted, points which, both among us and in other states, in proportion as they are the most excellent in their morals, are the most scrupulously observed. They say that Lysander the Lacedaemonian, whom I mentioned a little above, was accustomed to remark that Lacedaemon was the most honorable abode for old age, for nowhere is so much conceded to that time of life, nowhere is old age more respected. Nay, further, it is recorded that when at Athens during the games a certain elderly person had entered the theater, a place was nowhere offered him in that large assembly by his own townsmen. But when he had approached the Lacedaemonians, who, as they were ambassadors, had taken their seats together in a particular place, they all rose up and invited the old man to a seat, and when reiterated applause had been bestowed upon them by the whole assembly, one of them remarked that the Athenians knew what was right, but were unwilling to do it. There are many excellent rules in our college, but this of which I am treating especially, that in proportion as each man has taken the advantage in age, so he takes precedence in giving his opinion, and older augurs are preferred not only to those who are higher in office, but even to such as are in actual command. What pleasures, then, of the body can be compared with the privileges of authority, which they who have nobly employed seem to me to have consummated the drama of life, and not like inexpert performers to have broken down in the last act? Still, old men are peevish and fretful, and passionate and unmanageable, nay, if we seek for such, also covetous. But these are the faults of their characters, not of their old age. And yet, that peevishness and those faults which I have mentioned have some excuse, not quite satisfactory indeed, but such as may be admitted. They fancy that they are neglected, despised, made a jest of. Besides, in a weak state of body, every offense is irritating. All which defects, however, are extenuated by good dispositions and qualities and this may be discovered not only in real life, but on the stage, from the two brothers that are represented in The Brothers, how much austerity in the one, and how much gentleness in the other. Such is the fact, for as it is not every wine, so it is not every man's life that grows sour from old age. I approve of gravity in old age, but this in a moderate degree, like everything else, harshness by no means. What avarice in an old man can propose to itself I cannot conceive, for can anything be more absurd than in proportion as less of our journey remains to seek a greater supply of provisions? Death is welcome to the old. From the Dialogue on Old Age
An old man, indeed, has nothing to hope for. Yet he is in so much the happier state than a young one, since he has already attained what the other is only hoping for. The one is wishing to live long, the other has lived long. And yet, good gods, what is there in man's life that can be called long? For allow the latest period. Let us anticipate the age of the kings of the Tartessi. For there dwelt, as I find it recorded, a man named Arganthonius Agatis, who reigned for eighty years and lived one hundred and twenty. But to my mind, nothing whatever seems of long duration, in which there is any end. For when that arrives, then the time which has passed has flowed away. That only remains which you have secured by virtue and right conduct. Hours indeed depart from us, and days and months and years. Nor does past time ever return, nor can it be discovered what is to follow. Whatever time is assigned to each to live, with that he ought to be content. For neither need the drama be performed entire by the actor in order to give satisfaction, provided he be approved in whatever act he may be, nor need the wise man live till the plaudite, for the short period of life is long enough for living well and honorably. And if you should advance further, you need no more grieve than farmers do when the loveliness of springtime hath passed, that summer and autumn have come. For spring represents the time of youth, and gives promise of the future fruits. The remaining seasons are intended for plucking and gathering in those fruits. Now the harvest of old age, as I have often said, is the recollection and abundance of blessings previously secured. In truth, everything that happens agreeably to nature is to be reckoned among blessings. What, however, is so agreeable to nature as for an old man to die, which even is the lot of the young, though nature opposes and resists? And thus it is that young men seem to me to die just as when the violence of flame is extinguished by a flood of water, whereas old men die as the exhausted fire goes out, spontaneously, without the exertion of any force, and as fruits, when they are green, are plucked by force from the trees, but when ripe and mellow, drop off, so violence takes away their lives from youths, maturity from old men, a state which to me indeed is so delightful that the nearer I approach to death, I seem as if it were to be getting sight of land, and at length, after a long voyage, to be just coming into harbor. Great Orators and Their Training From The Dialogue on Oratory for who can suppose that amid the great multitude of students, the utmost abundance of masters, the most eminent geniuses among men, the infinite variety of causes, the most ample rewards offered to eloquence, there is any other reason to be found for the small number of orators than the incredible magnitude and difficulty of the art? A knowledge of a vast number of things is necessary, without which volubility of words is empty and ridiculous. Speech itself is to be formed, not merely by choice, but by careful construction of words, and all the emotions of the mind which nature has given to man must be intimately known, for all the force and art of speaking must be employed in allaying or exciting the feelings of those who listen. To this must be added a certain portion of grace and wit, learning worthy of a well-bred man, and quickness and brevity in replying as well as attacking, accompanied with a refined decorum and urbanity. Besides, the whole of antiquity and a multitude of examples is to be kept in the memory, nor is the knowledge of laws in general, or of the civil law in particular, to be neglected. And why need I add any remarks on delivery itself, which is to be ordered by action of body, by gesture, by look, and by modulation and variation of the voice, the great power of which, alone and in itself, the comparatively trivial art of actors and the stage proves, on which, though all bestow their utmost labor to form their look, voice, and gesture, who knows not how few there are, and have ever been, to whom we can attend with patience? What can I say of that repository for all things, the memory, which, unless it be made the keeper of the matter and words that are the fruits of thought and invention, all the talents of the orator we see, though they be of the highest degree of excellence, will be of no avail. Let us then cease to wonder what is the cause of the scarcity of good speakers, since eloquence results from all those qualifications, in each of which, singly, it is a great merit to labor successfully. And let us rather exhort our children and others whose glory and honor is dear to us, 
to contemplate in their minds the full magnitude of the object, and not to trust that they can reach the height at which they aim by the aid of the precepts, masters, and exercises that they are all now following, but to understand that they must adopt others of a different character. In my opinion, indeed, no man can be an orator possessed of every praiseworthy accomplishment unless he has attained the knowledge of everything important and of all liberal arts. For his language must be ornate and copious from knowledge, since unless there be beneath the surface matter understood and felt by the speaker, oratory becomes an empty and almost puerile flow of words. I am then of opinion, said Crassus, that nature and genius in the first place contribute most aid to speaking, and that to those writers on the art to whom Antonius just now alluded, it was not skill and method in speaking, but natural talent that was wanting. For there ought to be certain lively powers in the mind and understanding, which may be acute to invent, fertile to explain and adorn, and strong and retentive to remember. And if any one imagines that these powers may be acquired by art, which is false, for it is very well if they can be animated and excited by art, but they certainly cannot by art be engrafted or instilled, since they are all the gifts of nature. What will he say of those qualities which are certainly born with the man himself, volubility of tongue, tone of voice, strength of lungs, and a peculiar conformation and aspect of the whole countenance and body? I do not say that art cannot improve in these particulars, for I am not ignorant that what is good may be made better by education, and what is not very good may be in some degree polished and amended. But there are some persons so hesitating in their speech, so inharmonious in their tone of voice, or so unwieldy and rude in the air and movements of their bodies, that whatever power they possess, either from genius or art, they can never be reckoned in the number of accomplished speakers. While there are others so happily qualified in these respects, so eminently adorned with the gifts of nature, that they seem not to have been born like other men, but molded by some divinity, it is indeed a great task and enterprise for a person to undertake and profess that while everyone else is silent, he alone must be heard on the most important subjects and in a large assembly of men, for there is scarcely any one present who is not sharper and quicker to discover defects in the speaker than merits. And thus whatever offends the hearer effaces the recollection of what is worthy of praise. I do not make these observations for the purpose of altogether deterring young men from the study of oratory, even if they be deficient in some natural endowments. For who does not perceive that to see Calius, my contemporary, a new man, the mere mediocrity in speaking which he was enabled to attain was a great honor? Who does not know that Q. Varius, your equal in age, a clumsy, uncouth man, has obtained his great popularity by the cultivation of such faculties as he has. But as our inquiry regards the complete orator, we must imagine in our discussion an orator from whom every kind of fault is abstracted, and who is adorned with every kind of merit. For if the multitude of suits, if the variety of causes, if the rabble and barbarism of the forum afford room for even the most wretched speakers, we must not, for that reason, take our eyes from the object of our inquiry. In those arts in which it is not indispensable usefulness that is sought, but liberal amusement for the mind, how nicely, how almost fastidiously do we judge. For there are no suits or controversies which can force men, though they may tolerate indifferent orators in the forum, to endure also bad actors upon the stage. The orator, therefore, must take the most studious precaution not merely to satisfy those whom he necessarily must satisfy, but to seem worthy of admiration to those who are at liberty to judge disinterestedly. If you would know what I myself think, I will express to you, my intimate friends, what I have hitherto never mentioned, and thought that I never should mention. To me, those who speak best, and speak with the utmost ease and grace, appear if they do not commence their speeches with some timidity, and show some confusion in the exordium, to have almost lost the sense of shame, though it is impossible that such should not be the case. For the better qualified a man is to speak, the more he fears the difficulties of speaking, the uncertain success of a speech, and the expectation of the audience. But he who can produce and deliver nothing worthy of his subject, nothing worthy of the name of an orator, 
nothing worthy the attention of his audience, seems to me, though he be ever so confused while he is speaking, to be downright shameless. For we ought to avoid a character for shamelessness, not by testifying shame, but by not doing that which does not become us. But the speaker who has no shame, as I see to be the case with many, I regard as deserving not only of a rebuke, but of personal castigation. Indeed, what I often observe in you, I very frequently experience in myself, that I turn pale in the outset of my speech, and feel a tremor through my whole thoughts, as it were, and limbs. When I was a young man, I was on one occasion so timid in commencing an accusation, that I owed to Q. Maximus the greatest of obligations for immediately dismissing the assembly as soon as he saw me absolutely disheartened and incapacitated through fear. Here they all signified assent, looked significantly at one another, and began to talk together, for there was a wonderful modesty in Crassus, which, however, was not only no disadvantage to his oratory, but even an assistance to it, by giving it the recommendation of probity. End of section 21 Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 22 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 22. Selected Epistles by Cicero. Cicero to Tyro. The following epistles are taken by permission from Jeans's Letters of Cicero. This letter gives a vivid glimpse of Cicero's tenderness to his slaves and freedmen. Tyro was probably the first editor of his former master's letters. Egypta arrived here on the 12th of April. Although he reported that you were now quite rid of your fever and going on very well, he nevertheless caused me some anxiety by his report that you were not able to write to me, the more so because Hermia, who ought to have been here on the same day, has not yet come. I am more anxious than you can believe about your health. Only free me from this anxiety, and I will free you from all duties. I would write you more if I thought you could now read more with pleasure." Use all the talents you possess, of which I have no small opinion, to keep yourself safe for my sake as well as your own. Again and again I repeat, take every precaution about your health. Goodbye. P.S. Hermia is just come. I have your note with its poor, weak handwriting. No wonder, too, after so severe an illness. I sent out Egypta to stay with you because he is not a bad companion, and appeared to me to be fond of you, and with him a cook for you to make use of his services. Goodbye. Cicero to Atticus The family affection of Cicero might be illustrated by many such letters as the following. It being now eleven days since I left you, I am scrawling this little bit of a note just as I am leaving my country house before it is light. I think of being at my place at Inagnia today and Tusculum tomorrow, only one day there, so that I shall come up all right to time on the 28th. And oh, if I could but run on at once to embrace my Tolia and give Attica a kiss. Talking of this, by the by, do please write and let me know while I am stopping at Tusculum what her prattle is like, or, if she is away in the country, what her letters to you are about. Meanwhile, either send or give her my love, and Pilia too. And even though we shall meet immediately, yet will you write to me anything you can find to say? P.S. I was just fastening up this letter, but your courier has arrived here after a long night journey with your letter. I was very sorry, you may be sure, to find on reading it that Attica is feverish. Everything else that I was waiting for I now know from your note. But when you tell me that to have a little fire in the morning sent la vie le lard, I retort, il est sent plus, for one's poor old memory to begin to totter, because it was the twenty-ninth I had promised to Axius, the thirtieth to you and the day of my arrival, the 31st, to Quintus. So take that for yourself, you shall have no news. Then what on earth is the good of writing, and what good is it when we are together and chatter whatever comes to our tongues? Surely there is something in causury after all. Even if there is nothing under it, there is always at least the delicious feeling that we are talking with one another. Sulpicius consoles Cicero after his daughter Tullia's death. 
For some time after I had received the information of the death of your daughter Tolia, you may be sure that I bore it sadly and heavily, as much indeed as was right for me. I felt that I shared that terrible loss with you, and that had I but been where you are, you on your part would not have found me neglectful, and I on mine should not have failed to come to you and tell you myself how deeply grieved I am. And, though it is true that consolations of this nature are painful and distressing, because those dear friends and relations upon whom the task naturally devolves are themselves afflicted with a similar burden, and incapable even of attempting it without many tears, so that one would rather suppose them in need of the consolations of others for themselves than capable of doing this kind office to others. Yet nevertheless, I have decided to write to you briefly such reflections as have occurred to me on the present occasion. Not that I imagine them to be ignored by you, but because it is possible that you may be hindered by your sorrow from seeing them as clearly as usual. What reason is there why you should allow the private grief which has befallen you to distress you so terribly? Recollect how fortune has hitherto dealt with us, how we have been bereft of all that ought to be no less dear to men than their own children of country, position, rank, and every honorable office. If one more burden has now been laid upon you, could any addition be made to your pain? Or is there any heart that, having been trained in the school of such events, ought not now to be steeled by use against emotion, and think everything after them to be comparatively light? Or is it for her sake, I suppose, that you are grieving? How many times must you have arrived at the same conclusion as that into which I, too, have frequently fallen? that in these days theirs is not the hardest lot who are permitted painlessly to exchange their life for the grave. Now what was there at the present time that could attach her very strongly to life? What hope, what fruition, what consolation for the soul? The prospect of a wedded life with the husband chosen from our young men of rank? Truly one would think it was always in your power to choose a son-in-law of a position suitable to your rank out of our young men one to whose keeping you would feel you could safely entrust the happiness of a child, or that of being a joyful mother of children, who would be happy in seeing them succeeding in life, able by their own exertions to maintain in its integrity all that was bequeathed to them by their father, intending gradually to rise to all the highest offices of the state, and to use that liberty to which they were born for the good of their country and the service of their friends. Is there any one of these things that has not been taken away before it was given? but surely it is hard to give up one's children. It is hard, but this is harder still, that they should bear and suffer what we are doing. A circumstance which was such as to afford me no light consolation I cannot but mention to you, in the hope that it may be allowed to contribute equally towards mitigating your grief. As I was returning from Asia, when sailing from Aegina in the direction of Megara, I began to look around me at the various places by which I was surrounded. Behind me was Aegina, in front Megara, on the right the Piraeus, on the left Corinth, all of them towns that in former days were most magnificent, but are now lying prostrate and in ruins before one's eyes. Ah me, I began to reflect to myself, we poor feeble mortals, who can claim but a short life in comparison, complain as though a wrong was done us if one of our number dies in the course of nature, or has met his death by violence and here in one spot are lying stretched out before me the corpses of so many cities. Servius, be master of yourself, and remember that it is the lot of men to which you have been born. Believe me, I found myself in no small degree strengthened by these reflections. Let me advise you, too, if you think good, to keep this reflection before your eyes. How lately at one and the same time have many of our most illustrious men fallen, how grave an encroachment has been made on the rights of the sovereign people of Rome. Every province in the world has been convulsed with the shock. If the frail life of a tender woman has gone too, who being born to the common lot of man must needs have died in a few short years, even if the time had not come for her now, are you thus utterly stricken down? Do you then also recall your feelings and your thoughts from dwelling on this subject? and as beseems your character, bethink yourself rather of this, that she has lived as long as life was of value to her, that she has passed away only together with her country's freedom, that she lived to see her father elected praetor consul augur, that she had been the wife of young men of the first rank, 
that after enjoying well nigh every blessing that life can offer, she left it only when the Republic itself was falling. The account is closed, and what have you, what has she, to charge of injustice against fate? In a word, forget not that you are Cicero, that you are he who was always wont to guide others and give them good advice, and be not like those quack physicians, who, when others are sick, boast that they hold the key of the knowledge of medicine, to heal themselves are never able, but rather minister to yourself with your own hand the remedies which you are in the habit of prescribing for others, and put them plainly before your own soul. There is no pain so great but the lapse of time will lessen and assuage it. It is not like yourself to wait until this time comes, instead of stepping forward by your philosophy to anticipate that result. And if even those who are low in the grave have any consciousness at all, such was her love for you and her tenderness for all around her, that surely she does not wish to see this in you. Make this a tribute then to her who is dead, to all your friends and relations who are mourning in your grief, and make it to your country also, that if in anything the need should arise, she may be able to trust to your energy and guidance. Finally, since such is the condition we have come to, that even this consideration must perforce be obeyed, do not let your conduct induce any one to believe that it is not so much your daughter as the circumstances of the Republic and the victory of others which you are deploring. I shrink from writing to you at greater length upon this subject, lest I should seem to be doubtful of your own good sense. Allow me therefore to put before you one more consideration, and then I will bring my letter to a close. We have seen you not once but many times bearing prosperity most gracefully, and gaining yourself great reputation thereby. Let us see at last that you are capable also of bearing adversity equally well, and that it is not in your eyes a heavier burden than it ought to seem, lest we should think that of all the virtues this is the only one in which you are wanting. As for myself, when I find you are more composed in mind, I will send you information about all that is being done in these parts, and the state in which the province finds itself at present. Farewell. Cicero's reply to Sulpicius. Yes, my dear Servius, I could indeed wish you had been with me, as you say, at the time of my terrible trial. How much it was in your power to help me if you had been here, by sympathizing with, and, I may almost say, sharing equally in my grief, I readily perceive from the fact that after reading your letter I now feel myself considerably more composed. For not only was all that you wrote just what is best calculated to soothe affliction, but you yourself, in comforting me, showed that you too had no little pain at heart. Your son Servius, however, has made it clear, by every kindly attention which such an occasion would permit of, both how great his respect was for myself, and also how much pleasure his kind feeling for me was likely to give you. And you may be sure that while such attentions from him have often been more pleasant to me, they have never made me more grateful. It is not, however, only your arguments and your equal share, I may almost call it, in this affliction which comforts me, but also your authority, because I hold it shame in me not to be bearing my trouble in a way that you, a man endowed with such wisdom, think it ought to be borne. But at times I do feel broken down, and I scarcely make any struggle against my grief because those consolations fail me which under similar calamities were never wanting to any of those other people whom I put before myself as models for imitation. Both Fabius Maximus, for example, when he lost a son who had held the consulship, the hero of many a famous exploit, and Lucius Paulus, from whom two were taken in one week, and your own kinsman Gallus, and Marcus Cato, who was deprived of a son of the rarest talents and the rarest virtue, all these lived in times when their individual affliction was capable of finding a solace in the distinctions they used to earn from their country. For me, however, after being stripped of all those distinctions which you yourself recall to me, and which I had won for myself by unparalleled exertions, only that one solace remained which has been torn away. My thoughts were not diverted by work for my friends or by the administration of affairs of state. There was no pleasure in pleading in the courts. I could not bear the very sight of the Senate House. I felt, as was indeed too true, that I had lost all the harvest of both my industry and my success. But whenever I wanted to recollect that all this was shared with you and other friends I could name, 
and whenever I was breaking myself in and forcing my spirit to bear these things with patience, I always had a refuge to go to where I might find peace, and in whose words of comfort and sweet society I could rid me of all my pains and griefs. Whereas now, under this terrible blow, even those old wounds which seem to have healed up are bleeding afresh, for it is impossible for me now to find such a refuge from my sorrows at home in the business of the state, as in those days I did in that consolation of home, which was always in store whenever I came away sad from thoughts of state to seek for peace in her happiness. And so I stay away both from home and from public life, because home now is no more able to make up for the sorrow I feel when I think of our country than our country is for my sorrow at home. I am therefore looking forward all the more eagerly to your coming, and long to see you as early as that may possibly be, no greater alleviation can be offered me than a meeting between us for friendly intercourse and conversation. I hope, however, that your return is to take place, as I hear it is, very shortly. As for myself, while there are abundant reasons for wanting to see you as soon as possible, my principal one is in order that we may discuss together beforehand the best method of conduct for the present circumstances, which must entirely be adapted to the wishes of one man only, a man nevertheless who is far-seeing and generous, and also, as I think I have thoroughly ascertained, to me not at all ill-disposed, and to you extremely friendly. But admitting this, it is still a matter for much deliberation, what is the line, I do not say of action, but of keeping quiet, that we ought by his good leave and favor to adopt. Farewell. Homesick Exile I send this with love, my dearest Terentia, hoping that you and my little Tullia and my Marcus are all well. From the letters of several people and the talk of everybody, I hear that your courage and endurance are simply wonderful, and that no troubles of body or mind can exhaust your energy. How unhappy I am to think that with all your courage and devotion, your virtues and gentleness, you should have fallen into such misfortunes for me, and my sweet Tolia too, that she who was once so proud of her father should have to undergo such troubles owing to him. And what shall I say about my boy Marcus, who ever since his faculties of perception awoke has felt the sharpest pangs of sorrow and misery? Now could I but think, as you tell me, that all this comes in the natural course of things, I could bear it a little easier. But it has been brought about entirely by my own fault, for thinking myself loved by those who were jealous of me, and turning from those who wanted to win me. I have thanked the people you wanted me to, and mentioned that my information came from you. As to the block of houses which you tell me you mean to sell, why, good heavens, my dear Terencia, what is to be done? Oh, what troubles I have to bear! And if misfortune continues to persecute us, what will become of our poor boy? I cannot continue to write. My tears are too much for me nor would I wish to betray you into the same emotion. All I can say is that if our friends act up to their bounden duty, we shall not want for money. If they do not, you will not be able to succeed only with your own. Let our unhappy fortunes, I entreat you, be a warning to us not to ruin our boy, who is ruined enough already. If he only has something to save him from absolute want, a fair share of talent and a fair share of luck will be all that is necessary to win anything else. Do not neglect your health, and send me messengers with letters to let me know what goes on, and how you yourselves are faring. My suspense in any case cannot now be long. Give my love to my little Tolia and my Marcus. Dirachium, November 26th. P.S. I have moved to Dirachium because it is not only a free city, but very much in my interest, and quite near to Italy but if the bustle of the place proves an annoyance, I shall betake myself elsewhere and give you notice. Cicero's Vacillation in the Civil War Being in extreme agitation about these great and terrible events, and having no means of discussing matters with you in person, I want at any rate to avail myself of your judgment. Now, the question about which I am in doubt is simply this. If Pompeius should fly from Italy, which I suspect he will do, how do you think I ought to act? To make it easier for you to advise me, I will briefly set forth the arguments that occur to me on both sides of the question. The obligations that Pompeius laid me under in the matter of my restoration, my own intimacy with him, and also my patriotism, 
incline me to think that I ought to make my decision as his decision, or, in other words, my fortunes as his fortunes. There is this reason also. If I stay behind and desert my post among that band of true and illustrious patriots, I must perforce fall completely under the yoke of one man. Now, although he frequently takes occasion to show himself friendly to me, indeed, as you well know, anticipating this storm that is now hanging over our heads, I took good care that he should be so long ago, still I have to consider two different questions. First, how far can I trust him? And secondly, assuming it to be absolutely certain that he is friendly disposed to me, would it show the brave man or the honest citizen to remain in a city where one has filled the highest offices of peace and war, achieved immortal deeds, and been crowned with the honors of her most dignified priesthood, only to become an empty name and undergo some risk, attended also very likely with considerable disgrace, should Pompeius ever again grasp the helm? So much for this side. See now what may be said on the other. Pompeius has in our cause done nothing wisely, nothing strongly, nothing, I may add, that has not been contrary to my opinion and advice. I pass over those old complaints, that it was he who himself nourished this enemy of the Republic, gave him his honors, put the sword into his hand, that it was he who advised him to force laws through by violence, trampling on the warnings of religion, that it was he who made the addition of Transalpine Gaul, he who is his son-in-law, he who as augur allowed the adoption of Clodius, who showed more activity in recalling me than in preventing my exile, who took it on him to extend Caesar's term of government, who supported all his proceedings while he was away, that he, too, even in his third consulship, after he had begun to pose as a defender of the Constitution, actually exerted himself to get the ten tribunes to propose that absence should not invalidate the election. Nay, more, he expressly sanctioned this by one of his own acts, and opposed the consul, Marcus Marcellus, who proposed that the tenure of the Gallic provinces should come to an end on the 1st of March. But anyhow, to pass over all this, what could be more discreditable, what more blundering, than this evacuation of the city, or, I had better say, this ignominious flight? What terms ought not to have been accepted sooner than abandon our country? The terms were bad? That I allow. But is anything worse than this? But he will win back the Constitution? When? What preparations have been made to warrant such a hope? Have we not lost all Picanum? Have we not left open the road to the capital? Have we not abandoned the whole of our treasure, public and private, to the foe? In a word, there is no common cause, no strength, no center to draw such people together as might yet care to show fight for the Republic. Apulia has been chosen, the most thinly populated part of Italy, and the most remote from the line of movement of this war. It would seem that in despair they were looking for flight, with some easy access to the coast. I took the charge of Capua much against my will, not that I would evade that duty, but in a cause which evoked no sympathy from any class as a whole, nor any openly even from individuals. There was some, of course, among the good citizens, but as languid as usual and where I saw for myself that the mass of the people, and all the lowest stratum, were more and more inclined to the other side, many even longing for a revolution, I told him to his face I would undertake to do nothing without forces and without money. Consequently, I have had no responsibility at all, because I saw from the very first that nothing was really intended but flight. Say that I now follow this, then whither? Not with him. I had already set out to join him when I found that Caesar was in those parts, so that I could not safely reach Lucaria. I must sail by the western sea in the depth of winter, not knowing where to steer for. And again, what about being with my brother, or leaving him and taking my son? How then must I act, since either alternative will involve the greatest difficulty, the greatest mental anxiety? And then, too, what a raid he will make on me and my fortunes when I am out of the way fiercer than on other people, because he will think, perhaps, that in outrages on me he holds a means of popularity. Again, these fetters, remember, I mean these laurels on my attendant staves, how inconvenient it is to take them out of Italy. What place indeed will be safe for me, supposing I now find the sea calm enough, before I have actually joined him, though where that will be and how to get there I have no notion. 
On the other hand, say that I stop where I am and find some place on this side of the water. Then my conduct will precisely resemble that of Philippus or Lucius Flaccus or Quintus Mucius under Cinna's reign of terror. And however this decision ended for the last name, yet still he at any rate used to say that he saw what really did happen would occur, but that it was his deliberate choice in preference to marching sword in hand against the homes of the very city that gave him birth. With Thrasybulus it was otherwise, and perhaps better. But still, there is a sound basis for the policy and sentiments of Musius, as there is also for this which Philippus did, to wait for your opportunity when you must, just as much as not lose your opportunity when it is given. But even in this case, those staves again of my attendance still involve some awkwardness. For say that his feelings are friendly to me. I am not sure that this is so, but let us assume it. Then he will offer me a triumph. I fear that to decline may be perilous, to accept an offense with all good citizens. Ah, you exclaim, what a difficult, what an insoluble problem. Yet the solution must be found for what can one do? And lest you should have formed the idea that I am rather inclined towards staying because I have argued more on that side of the question, it is quite possible, as is so frequently the case in debates, that one side has more words, the other more worth. Therefore, I should be glad if when you give me your opinion, you would look upon me as making up my mind quite dispassionately on a most important question. I have a ship both at Caida and at Brundisium. But lo and behold, while I am writing you these very lines by night in my house at Calus, in come the carriers, and here is a letter to say that Caesar is before Corfinium, and that in Corfinium is Domitius, with an army resolute and even eager for battle. I do not think our chief will go so far as to be guilty of abandoning Domitius, though it is true he had already sent Scipio on before two cohorts to Brundisium and written a dispatch to the consuls ordering that the legion enrolled by Faustus should go under the command of one consul to Sicily. But it is a scandal that Domitius should be left to his fate when he is imploring him for help. There is some hope, not in my opinion a very good one, but strong in these parts, that there has been a battle in the Pyrenees between Aphranius and Trebonius, that Trebonius has been beaten off, that your friend Fabius also has come over to us with all his troops, and, to crown it all, that Aphranius is advancing with a strong force. If this be so, we shall perhaps make a stand in Italy. As for me, since Caesar's route is uncertain, he is expected about equally by way of Capua and of Luceria. I have sent Lepta to Pompeius with a letter, while I myself, for fear of falling in with him anywhere, have started again for Formiae. I thought it best to let you know this, and am writing with more composure than I have written of late, not inserting any opinion of my own, but trying to elicit yours. End of section 22. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 23 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 9, Section 23, Cicero's Correspondence. It seems desirable to add a few letters by other hands than Cicero's, to indicate the manifold sidelights thrown on the inner history of this intensely interesting period. Sulpicius' famous attempt at consolation has already been given above. Two brief letters by Caesar will illustrate the dictator's marvelous ability to comprehend and control other men. Pompey's gruff rudeness forms a contrast which is hardly accidental on the editor's part. Caelius' wit is biting as ever. And lastly, Matthew's protest against being persecuted merely because he, who loved Caesar, openly mourned for his dead friend, has an unconscious tone of simple heroism unequaled in the entire correspondence. W. C. Lee Caesar to Cicero You know me too well not to keep up your character as an augur by divining that nothing is more entirely alien from my nature than cruelty. I will add, 
that while my decision is in itself a great source of pleasure to me, to find my conduct approved by you is a triumph of gratification. Nor does the fact at all disturb me that those people whom I have set at liberty are reported to have gone their ways only to renew the attack upon me, because there is nothing I wish more than that I may ever be as true to my own character as they to theirs. May I hope that you will be near town when I am there, so that I may as usual avail myself in everything of your advice and means of assistance. Let me assure you that I am charmed beyond everything with your relation Dolabella, to whom I shall acknowledge myself indeed indebted for this obligation, for his kindliness is so great, and his feeling and affection for me are such, that he cannot possibly do otherwise. Caesar to Cicero Though I had fully made up my mind that you would do nothing rashly, nothing imprudently, still I was so far impressed by the rumors in some quarters as to think it my duty to write to you, and ask it as a favor due to our mutual regard that you will not take any step, now that the scale is so decisively turned, which you would not have thought it necessary to take, even though the balance still stood firm. For it will really be both a heavier blow to our friendship, and a step on your part still less judicious for yourself, if you are to be thought, not even to have bowed the knee to success, for things seem to have fallen out as entirely favorably for us, as disastrously for them, nor yet to have been drawn by attachment to a particular cause, for that has undergone no change since you decided to remain aloof from their counsels, but to have passed a stern judgment on some act of mine, than which, from you, no more painful thing could befall me, and I claim the right of our friendship to entreat that you will not take this course. Finally, what more suitable part is there for a good peace-loving man and a good citizen than to keep aloof from civil dissensions? There were not a few who admired this course, but could not adopt it, by reason of its danger. You, after having duly weighed both the conclusions of friendship and the unmistakable evidence of my whole life, will find that there is no safer nor more honorable course than to keep entirely aloof from the struggle. Pompey to Cicero Today, the 10th of February, Fabius Vergilianus has joined me. From him I learn that Domitius with his eleven cohorts and fourteen cohorts that Vibulius had brought up is on his way to me. His intention was to start from Corfinium on the 13th, Herus to follow soon after with five of the cohorts, I decide that you are to come to us at Luceria. Here I think you will be most in safety. Caelius in Rome to Cicero in Cilicia The capture of his Parthian majesty and the storming of Soloikeia itself had not been enough to compensate for missing the sight of our doings here. Your eyes would never have ached again if you had only seen the face of Domitius when he was not elected. The election was important, and it was quite clear that party feeling determined the side which people took. Only a few could be brought to acknowledge the claims of friendship. Consequently, Domitius is so furious with me that he scarcely hates any of his most intimate friends as much as he does me, and all the more because he thinks that it was to do him wrong that his hopes of being in the College of Augurs are snatched away and that I am responsible for it. He is savage now to see everybody so delighted in his mortification, and myself more active than anybody, with one exception, on behalf of Antonius. As to political prospects, I have often mentioned to you that I do not see any chance of peace lasting a year, and the nearer that struggle which must infallibly take place is drawing to us, the more manifest does its danger become. The point at issue about which our lords and masters are going to fight is this. Pompeius has absolutely determined not to allow Caesar to be elected consul on any terms except a previous resignation of his army and his government, 
while Caesar is convinced that he must inevitably fall if he separates himself from his army. He offers, however, this compromise, that they should both of them resign their armies. So you see, their great affection for one another, and their much-abused alliance, has not even dwindled down into suppressed jealousy, but has broken out into open war. Nor can I discover what is the wisest course to take in my own interests, a question which I make no doubt will give much trouble to you also. For while I have both interest and connections among those who are on one side, on the other too it is the cause and not the men themselves I dislike. You are not, I feel sure, blind to the fact that where parties are divided within a country, we are bound, so long as the struggle is carried on, with none but constitutional weapons, to support the more honorable cause. But when we come to blows and to open war, then the safer one, and to count that cause the better which is the less likely to be dangerous. In the present division of feeling I see that Pompeius will have the Senate and all judicially-minded people on his side. Those who have everything to dread and little to hope for will flock to Caesar. The army is not to be compared. On the whole, we have plenty of time for balancing the strength of parties and making our decision. I had all but forgotten my principal reason for writing. Have you heard of the wonderful doings of our Senzel Appius? how he is rigorously inquiring into our statues and pictures, our amount of land and our debts. He has persuaded himself that his censorship is a moral soap or toilet powder. He is wrong, I take it, for while he only wants to wash off the dirt, he is really laying bare his veins and his flesh. Heaven and earth, you must run and come to laugh at the things here. Appius questioning about pictures and statues. You must make haste, I assure you. Our friend Curio is thought to have acted wisely in giving way about the pay of Pompeius troops. If I must sum up my opinion, as you ask, about what will happen, unless one or other of them consents to go and fight the Parthians, I see a great split impending, which will be settled by the sword and by force. Each is well inclined for this and well equipped. If it could only be without danger to yourself, you would find this a great and most attractive drama which fortune is rehearsing. Matthews to Cicero I received great pleasure from your letter, because I found that your opinion of me was what I had hoped and wished it to be, nor that I was in any doubt about it, but for the very reason that I valued it so highly. I was most anxious that it should remain unimpaired. Conscious, however, that I had done nothing which would give offence to the feelings of any good citizen, I was naturally the less inclined to believe that you, adorned as you are with so many excellences of the most admirable kind, could have allowed yourself to be convinced of anything on mere idle report, particularly seeing that you were a friend for whom my spontaneous attachment had been and still was unbroken. And knowing now that it has been as I hoped, I will answer those attacks which you have often opposed on my behalf, as was fairly to be expected from your well-known generosity and the friendship existing between us. For I am well aware of all they have been heaping on me since Caesar's death, they make it a reproach against me that I go heavily for the loss of a friend, and think it cruel that one whom I loved should have fallen, because, say they, country must be put before friends, as though they have hitherto been successful in proving that his death really was the gain of the commonwealth. But I will not enter any subtle plea. I admit that I have not attained to your higher grades of philosophy, for I have neither been a partisan of Caesar in our civil dissensions, though I did not abandon my friend, even when his action was a stumbling-block to me. Nor did I ever give my approval to the civil war, or even to the actual ground of quarrel, of which indeed I earnestly desired that the first spark should be trampled out. And so, in the triumph of a personal friend, 
I was never ensnared by the charms, either of place or of money, prizes which have been recklessly abused by the rest, though they had less influence with him than I had. I may even say that my own private property was impaired by that act of Caesar, thanks to which many of those who are rejoicing at Caesar's death continued to live in their own country. That our defeated fellow countrymen should be spared was as much an object to me as my own safety. Is it possible then for me, who wanted all to be left uninjured, not to feel indignation, that he, by whom this was secured, is dead? Above all, when the very same men were the cause at once of his own popularity and his untimely end. You shall smart then, say they, since you dare to disapprove of our deed. What unheard of insolence! One man they may boast of a deed, which another is not even allowed to lament without punishment. Why, even slaves have always been free of this, to feel their fears, their joys, their sorrows as their own, and not at anybody's else dictation. And these are the very things which now, at least according to what your liberators have always in their mouth, they are trying to wrest from us by terrorism, but they try in vain. There is no danger which has terrors enough ever to make me desert the side of gratitude or humanity. For never have I thought that death in a good cause is to be shunned, often indeed that it deserves to be courted. But why are they inclined to be enraged with me, if my wishes are simply that they may come to regret their deed, desiring, as I do, that Caesar's death may be felt to be untimely by us all? It is my duty as a citizen to desire the preservation of the Constitution. Well, unless both my life in the past and all my hopes for the future prove without any words of mine that I do earnestly desire this, I make no demand to prove it by my professions. To you, therefore, I make a specially earnest appeal to let facts come before assertions, and to take my word for it, that, if you feel that honesty is the best policy, it is impossible I should have any association with lawless villains. Or can you believe that the principles I pursued in the days of my youth, when even error could pass with some excuse, I shall renounce now that I am going down the hill, and with my own hands unravel all the web of my life? That I will not do, nor yet will I commit any act that could give offence, beyond the fact that I do lament the sad fall of one who was to me the dearest friend and the most illustrious of men. But were I otherwise disposed, I would never deny what I was doing, lest it should be thought I was at once shameless in doing wrong, and false and cowardly in dissembling it. But then I undertook the management of those games which Caesar's heir celebrated for Caesar's victory. Well, this is a matter which belongs to one's private obligations, not to any political arrangement. It was, however, in the first place a tribute of respect, which I was called upon to pay, to the memory and the eminent position of a man whom I dearly loved, even though he was dead, and also one that I could not refuse, at the request of a young man so thoroughly promising, and so worthy in every way of Caesar as he is. Again, I have frequently paid visits of compliment to the consul Antonius, and you will find that the very men who think me but a lukewarm patriot are constantly going to his house in crowds, actually for the purpose of soliciting or carrying away some favor. But what a monstrous claim it is, that while Caesar never laid any such embargo as this to prevent me from associating freely with anybody I pleased, even if they were people whom he personally did not like, these men who have robbed me of my friend should attempt, by malicious insinuations, to prevent my showing a kindness to whomsoever I will. I have, however, no fear that the moderation of my life will hereafter prove an insufficient defense against false insinuations, and that even those who do not love me because of my loyalty to Caesar, 
would not rather have their own friend imitate me than themselves. Such a life as remains to me, at least if I succeed in what I desire, I shall spend in quiet at Rhodes. But if I find that some chance has put a stop to this, I shall simply live at Rome as one who is always desirous that right should be done. I am deeply grateful to our good friend Trebatius for having thus disclosed to me your sincere and friendly feeling, and given me even an additional reason for honouring and paying respect to one whom it has always been a pleasure to me to regard as a friend. Farewell heartily, and let me have your esteem. End of section 23「ライブラリー・オブ・ザ・ワールド・ベスト・リテラチュー・エンシェント・アン・モダーン・ボリューム9」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.「ライブラリー・オブ・ザ・ワールド・ベスト・リテラチュー・エンシェント・アン・モダーン・ボリューム9」Section 24 The Dream of Scipio by Cicero From The Dialogue, The Republic, Translation of Professor T. R. Lonsbury When I went into Africa with the consul Manius Manilius, holding the rank, as you are aware, of military tribune of the Fourth Legion, nothing lay nearer to my heart than to meet Massinissa, a king who, for good reasons, was on the most friendly terms with our family. When I had come to him, the old man embraced me with tears, and then looking up to heaven said, I give thanks to thee, O supremest soul, and to you, ye inhabitants of heaven, that before I depart this life I behold in my dominions and under this roof Publius Cornelius Scipio, by whose very name I am revived, so never passes away from my mind the memory of that best and most invincible hero. Thereupon I made inquiries of him, as to the state of his own kingdom, and he of me as to our republic, and with many words uttered on both sides, we spent the whole of that day. Moreover, after partaking of a repast prepared with royal magnificence, we prolonged the conversation late into the night. The old man would speak of nothing but Africanus, and remembered not only all his deeds, but likewise his sayings. After we parted to go to bed, a sounder sleep than usual fell upon me, partly on account of weariness occasioned by the journey, and partly because I had stayed up to a late hour. Then Africanus appeared to me, I think in consequence of what we had been talking about, for it often happens that our thoughts and speeches bring about in sleep something of that illusion of which Ennius writes in regard to himself and Homer, of which poet he was very often accustomed to think and speak while awake. Africanus showed himself to me in that form, which was better known to me from his ancestral image than from my recollection of his person. As soon as I recognized him, I was seized with a fit of terror, but he thereupon said, Be of good courage, O Scipio, lay aside fear, and commit to memory these things which I am about to say. Do you see that state which, compelled by me to submit to the Roman people, renews its former wars, and cannot endure to remain at peace? At these words, from a certain lustrous and bright place, very high and full of stars, he pointed out to me Carthage. To fight against that city, thou no comest in a rank, but little above that of a private soldier. But in two years from this time, thou shalt as consul utterly overthrow it, and in consequence shalt gain, by thy own exertions, that very surname of Africanus, which up to this time thou hast inherited from us. But when thou shalt have destroyed Carthage, shalt have had the honour of a triumph, and shalt have been censor, thou shalt during thy absence be chosen consul for a second time, shalt put an end to a great war, and lay Numantia in ruins. But when thou shalt be carried in thy 
triumphal chariot to the capital, thou wilt find the republic disturbed by the designs of my grandson. Then, O Scipio, it will be necessary that thou exhibit the purity and greatness of thy heart, thy soul, and thy judgment. But I see at that time a double way disclose itself, as if the fates were undecided. For when thy life shall have completed eight times seven revolutions of the sun, and these two numbers, each one of which is looked upon as perfect, the one for one reason, the other for another, shall have accomplished for thee, by their natural revolution, the fatal product, to thee alone, and to thy name the whole state shall turn, upon thee the senate, upon thee all good men, upon thee the allies, upon thee the Latins, will fasten their eyes, thou wilt be the one upon whom the safety of the state shall rest, and in short, as dictator, it will be incumbent on thee to establish and regulate the republic, if thou art successful in escaping the impious hands of kinsmen. At this point Laelius uttered an exclamation of sorrow, and the rest groaned more deeply. But Scipio, slightly smiling, said, Keep silence, I beg of you. Do not awake me from my dream, and hear the rest of his words. But, O Africanus, that thou mayest be the more zealous in the defense of the Republic, know this. For all who have preserved, who have succored, who have aggrandized their country, there is in heaven a certain fixed place, where they enjoy an eternal life of blessedness. For to that highest God who governs the whole world, there is nothing which can be done on earth more dear than those combinations of men and unions, made under the sanction of law, which are called states. The rulers and preservers of them depart from this place, and to it they return. I had been filled with terror, not so much at the fear of death, as at the prospect of treachery on the part of those akin to me. Nevertheless, at this point I had the courage to ask whether my father Paulus was living, and others whom we thought to be annihilated. Certainly, said he, they alone live who have been set free from the fetters of the body, as if from prison, for that which you call your life is nothing but death. Nay, thou mayest even behold thy father Paulus coming towards thee. No sooner had I seen him than I burst into a violent fit of tears, but he, thereupon, embracing and kissing me, forbade my weeping. I, as soon as I had checked my tears, and was able again to speak, said to him, Tell me, I beseech thee, O best and most sacred father, since this is life, as I hear Africanus say, why do I tarry upon earth? Why shall I not hasten to go to you? Not so, said he, not until that God, whose temple is all this which thou seest, shall have freed thee from the bonds of the body, can any entrance lie open to thee here. For men are brought into the world with this design, that they may protect and preserve that globe which thou seest in the middle of this temple, and which is called earth. To them a soul is given from these everlasting fires, which you name constellations and stars, which in the form of globes and spheres run with incredible rapidity the rounds of their orbits under the impulse of divine intelligences. Wherefore by thee, O Publius, and by all pious men, the soul must be kept in the guardianship of the body, nor without the command of him by whom it is given to you can there be any departure from this mortal life, lest you seem to have shunned the discharge of that duty as men which has been assigned to you by God. But, O Scipio, like as thy grandfather who stands here, like as I who gave thee life, Cherish the sense of justice and loyal affection, which latter, in however great measure, due to thy parents and kinsmen, is most all due to thy country. Such a life is the way to heaven, and to that congregation of those who have ended their days on earth, and freed from the body, dwell in that place which you see, that place which, as you have learned from the Greeks, you are in the habit of calling the Milky Way. 
This was a circle shining among the celestial fires with a most brilliant whiteness. As I looked from it, all other things seemed magnificent and wonderful. Moreover, they were such stars as we have never seen from this point of space, and all of such magnitude as we have never even suspected. Among them, that was the least which, the farthest from heaven and the nearest to earth, shone with a borrowed light but the starry globes far exceeded the size of the earth. Indeed, the earth itself appeared to me so small that I had a feeling of mortification at the sight of our empire, which took up what seemed to be but a point of it. As I kept my eyes more intently fixed upon this spot, Africanus said to me, How long, I beg of thee, will thy spirit be chained down to earth? Seest thou not into what a holy place thou hast come? Everything is bound together in nine circles, or rather spheres, of which the farthest is the firmament, which embraces the rest, is indeed the supreme God himself, confining and containing all the others. To that highest heaven are fixed those orbits of the stars, which eternally revolve. Below it are seven spheres, which move backward with a motion contrary to that of the firmament. One of these belongs to that star, which on earth they call Saturn. Then follows that shining orb, the source of happiness and health to the human race, which is called Jupiter. Then the red planet, bringing terror to the nations, to which you give the name of Mars. Then, almost directly under the middle region, stands the sun, the leader, the chief, the governor of the other luminaries, the soul of the universe, and its regulating principle, of a size so vast that it penetrates and fills everything with its own light. Upon it, as if they were an escort, follow two spheres, the one of Venus, the other of Mercury, and in the lowest circle revolves the moon, illuminated by the rays of the sun. Below it there is nothing, which is not mortal and transitory, save the souls which are given to mankind by the gift of the gods. Above the moon all things are eternal. For that ninth sphere which is in the middle is the earth. It has no motion, it is the lowest in space, and all heavy bodies are borne toward it by their natural downward tendency. I looked at these, lost in wonder, as soon as I had recovered myself, I said, What is this sound so great and so sweet which fills my ears? This, he replied, is the music which, composed of intervals unequal, but divided proportionately by rule, is caused by the swing and movement of the spheres themselves, and by the proper combination of acute tones with grave, creates with uniformity, manifold and diverse harmonies. For movements so mighty cannot be accomplished in silence, and it is a law of nature that the farthest sphere on the one side gives forth a bass tone, the farthest on the other a treble, for which reason the revolution of that uppermost arch of the heaven, the starry firmament, whose motion is more rapid, is attended with an acute and high sound, while that of the lowest, or lunar arc, is attended with a very deep and grave sound. For the ninth sphere, the earth, embracing the middle region of the universe, stays immovably in one fixed place, but those eight globes between, two of which have the same essential action, produce tones, distinguished by intervals, to the number of seven, which number indeed is the knot of almost all things. Men of skill, by imitating the result on the strings of the lyre, or by means of the human voice, have laid open for themselves a way of return to this place, just as other men of lofty souls have done the same by devoting themselves during their earthly life to the study of what is divine. But the ears of men, surfeited by this harmony, have become deaf to it, nor is there in you any duller sense, just as, at that cataract which is called Catadupa, where the Nile rushes down headlong from the lofty mountain tops, the people who dwell in that neighborhood 
have lost the sense of hearing in consequence of the magnitude of the sound. So likewise this harmony, produced by the excessively rapid revolution of the whole universe, is so great that the heirs of men are not able to take it in, in the same manner as you are not able to look the sun in the eye, and your sight is overcome by the power of its rays. Though I was filled with wonder, nevertheless I kept turning my eyes from time to time to the earth. I perceive, then said Africanus, that though still continuous to contemplate the habitation of the home of man, if that seems to thee as small as it really is, keep then thy eyes fixed on these heavenly objects, look with contempt on those of mortal life, for what notoriety that lives in the mouths of men, or what glory that is worthy of being sought after, art thou able to secure? Thou seest that the earth is inhabited in a few small localities, and that between those inhabited places, spots as it were on the surface, vast desert regions lie spread out, and that those who inhabit the earth are not only so isolated, that no communication can pass among them from one to another, but that some dwell in an oblique direction, as regards you, some in a diagonal, and some stand even exactly opposite you. From these you are certainly not able to hope for any glory. Moreover, thou observest that this same earth is surrounded, and as it were girdled by certain zones, of which thou seest that too, the farthest apart, and resting at both sides on the very poles of the sky, are stiffened with frost, and that again, the central and largest one is burned up with the heat of the sun. Two are habitable, of these the southern one, in which dwell those who make their footprints opposite yours, is a foreign world to your race. But even this other one, which lies to the north which you occupy, see with how small a part of it you come into contact. For all the land which is cultivated by you, very narrow at the extremities but wider at the sides, is only a small island surrounded by that water which on earth you call the Atlantic, or the Great Sea, or the Ocean. But though its name is so high-sounding, yet thou beholdest how small it is. From these cultivated and well-known regions can either thy name or the name of any of us surmount and pass this Caucasus which thou seest, or cross yonder flood of the Ganges? Who in the farthest remaining regions of the rising and the setting sun, or on the confines of the north and the south, will hear thy name? When these are taken away, thou assuredly perceivest how immense is the littleness of that space in which your reputation seeks to spread itself abroad. Moreover, even those who speak of us, for how long a time will they speak? Nay, even if the generations of men were desirous, one after the other, to hand down to posterity the praises of any one of us heard from their fathers, nevertheless on account of the changes in the earth, wrought by inundations and conflagration, which are sure to recur at certain fixed epochs, we are not simply unable to secure for ourselves a glory which lasts forever but are even unable to gain a glory which lasts for a long time. Moreover, of what value is it that the speech of those who are to be born hereafter shall be about thee, when nothing has been said of thee by all those who were born before, who were neither fewer in number and were unquestionably better men, especially when no one is able to live in the memory of those very persons of whom one's name can be heard, for the space of one year. For men commonly measure the year by the return to its place of the sun alone, that is, of one star, but when all the stars shall have returned to that same point, from which they once set out, and after a long period of time, have brought back the same relative arrangement of the whole heaven, that, then, can justly be called the complete year. 
in it I hardly dare say how many ages of human life are contained. For once in the past the sun seemed to disappear from the eyes of men and to be annihilated, and the time when the soul of Romulus made its way into this very temple, when, from the same region of the sky, and at the same moment of time, the sun shall have again vanished, then be sure that all constellations and stars have come back to the position they had in the beginning, and that the perfect year is completed. Of that year know that now not even the twentieth part has passed. Wherefore, if thou givest up the hope of a return to this place, in which all things exist for lofty and preeminent souls, yet of how much value is that human glory, which can hardly endure for even the small part of a single year? But if, as I was saying, thou wishest to look on high, and to fix thy gaze upon this abode of the blessed and this eternal home, never give thyself up to the applause of the vulgar, nor rest the recompense of thy achievements in the rewards which can be bestowed upon thee by men. It is incumbent on thee that virtue herself shall draw thee by her own charm to true glory. As for the way in which others talk about thee, let them take care of that themselves. Yet, without doubt, they will talk. But all such renown is limited to the petty provinces of the regions which thou seest, nor in the case of any one is it everlasting, for it both dies with the death of men, and is buried in oblivion by the forgetfulness of posterity. When he had said these things, O Africanus, I replied, if the path that leads to the entrance of heaven lies open to those who have rendered great service to their country, although in following from my boyhood in thy footsteps, and in those of my father, I have not failed in sustaining the honor derived from you, yet henceforth I shall toil with far more zeal, now that so great a reward has been held out before me. Do thou indeed, said he, continue to strive, and bear this in mind, that those thyself are not mortal, but this body of thine. For thou art not the one which that form of thine proclaims thee to be, but the soul of any one that alone is he, not that external shape which can be pointed out with the finger. Therefore know thyself to be a god, if that is essentially god which lives, which feels, which remembers, which foresees, which rules and regulates and moves that body over which it is put in authority as the supreme being governs this universe, and as the eternal God moves the world, which in a certain point of view is perishable, so the incorruptible soul moves the corruptible body. For what always moves itself is eternal, but that which communicates to anything a motion which it has itself received from another source must necessarily have an end of life when it has an end of motion. Therefore, that alone never ceases to move, which moves itself, for the reason that it is never deserted by itself. This indeed is the wellhead, this the beginning of motion to all other things that are moved. But to a beginning there is no birth, for all things are born from the beginning. But it itself cannot be born of anything, for that would not be a beginning which sprang from some other source. And just as it is never begotten, so it never dies. For a beginning annihilated could neither itself be brought back to life by anything else, nor could it create anything else out of itself, since it is necessary that all things should come from a beginning. So it results that the beginning of motion is in itself, because it is self-moved. And this can neither be born nor die, for if it did, the heavens would fall to ruin, and all nature would stand still, nor could it come into the possession of any power by the original impulse of which it might be put into motion. Since therefore it is clear that what is self-moved is eternal, who can deny that this essential characteristic has been imparted to the soul? 
for everything which is moved by a foreign impulse is without a soul, but that which lives is made to go by an inward motion of its own, for this is the special nature and power of the soul. But if it is the one thing among all which is self-moved, then certainly it has had no beginning, and is eternal. Do thou, then, employ it in the noblest duties, but those are the loftiest cares which are concerned with the well-being of our native land. The soul that is inspired by these, and occupied with them, will hasten the quicker into this its real home and habitation. So much the more speedily, indeed, will it do this, if while it is shut up in the body, it shall pass beyond its limits, and by the contemplation of those things which are outside of it, shall withdraw itself as far as possible from the body. For the souls of those who have given themselves up to sensual pleasures, and have made themselves, as it were, ministers to these, and who under the pressure of desires, which are subservient to these pleasures, have violated the laws of God and man, when they shall have parted from the body, will fly about the earth itself, nor will return to this place, until they shall have suffered torments for many ages. He departed. I awoke from my sleep. End of section 24